The Silence of the Lambs, a novel by Thomas Harris, told by Kathy Bates. Behavioral Science, the FBI section that deals with serial murder, is on the bottom floor of the Academy building at Quantico, half buried in the earth. Clarice Starling reached it flushed after a fast walk from the firing range. No one was in the outer office, so she briefly fluffed her hair using her reflection in the glass doors. She knew she could look all right without further primping. Her hands smelled of gun smoke, but there was no time to wash. Section Chief Crawford's summons said now. She found Jack Crawford alone in the cluttered suite of offices. What she saw disturbed her. Normally, Crawford, 53, looked like a fit middle-aged engineer. But now he was thin and had dark puffs under his reddened eyes. Starling hoped Crawford wasn't on the juice. That seemed most unlikely here. Crawford took her file from under his arm and opened it. Starling, Clarice M., good morning. Hello. Her smile was only polite. I hope the call didn't spook you. No. Not totally true, Starling thought. Your instructors tell me you're doing well, top quarter of the class. I hope so, they haven't posted anything. I ask them from time to time. That surprised Darling. She had written the man off as a two-faced son of a bitch. She had met Special Agent Crawford when he was a guest lecturer at the University of Virginia. The quality of his criminology seminars was a factor in her coming to the Bureau. She wrote him a note when she qualified for the Academy, but he never replied. And for the three months she had been a trainee at Quantico, he had ignored her. Starling came from country people who do not ask for favors or press for friendship. But she was puzzled and regretful at Crawford's behavior. Now, in his presence, she liked him again, she was sorry to note. Starling, you put down in your file that you want to come directly to behavioral science when you get through with the academy. I do. You have a lot of forensics, but no law enforcement background. We look for six years minimum. My father was a marshal. I know the life. Crawford smiled a little. What you do have is a double major in psychology and criminology and two summers working in a mental health center. Your counselor's license, is it current? It's good for two more years. I got it before you had the seminar at UVA, before I decided to do this. You got stuck in the hiring freeze. I was lucky, though. I found out in time to qualify as a forensic fellow. Then I could work in the lab until the academy had an opening. You wrote to me about coming here, and I don't think I answered. I know I didn't. I should have. Do you know about VICAP? I know it's the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. The law enforcement bulletin says you're working on a database, but you aren't operational yet. We've developed a questionnaire. It applies to all the known serial murderers in modern times. He handed her a thick sheaf of papers in a flimsy binding. Clarice Starling's self-interest snuffled ahead like a keen beagle. She smelled a job offer coming. Getting into behavioral science in any capacity she could was tempting. Do you spook easily, Starling? Not yet. See, we've tried to interview and evaluate all the known serial murderers we have in custody in order to build a database for psychological profiling and unsolved cases. Most of the subjects went along with it, but we haven't been able to get the one man we want the most. I want you to go after him tomorrow. Clarice Starling felt a glad knocking in her chest, and some apprehension, too. Who's the subject? The psychiatrist, Dr. Hannibal Lecter. Starling looked at Crawford steadily. Hannibal the cannibal, she said. Yes, well, I'm glad of the chance, but you have to know I'm wondering, why me? Mainly because you're available. I don't expect him to cooperate. He's already refused through an intermediary, the director of the hospital. But I have to be able to say our qualified examiner went to him and asked him personally. I don't have anyone else. You're jammed. Buffalo Bill and the things in Nevada, Starling said. You got it. Not enough warm bodies. Any bearing on a current case? No, I wish there were. If he balks on me, do you still want a psychological evaluation? No, I'm waist deep in inaccessible patient evaluations of Dr. Lecter, and they're all different. Crawford mixed an Alka-Seltzer at the water cooler. It's ridiculous, you know. Lecter writes for the psychiatric journals himself. Extraordinary stuff. But it's never about his own little anomalies. Once he pretended to cooperate with the hospital director, Dr. Chilton, in some tests. Lecter sitting with a blood pressure cuff on his penis while looking at pictures of disasters. Lecter published all that he'd learned about Chilton and made a fool out of him. 
He responds to serious correspondence from psychiatric students in fields unrelated to his case, and that's all he does. If he won't talk to you, I just want straight reporting. How does he look? How does his cell look? What's he doing? Local color, so to speak. Crawford leaned forward until he faced her at a distance of two feet. Be very careful with Hannibal Lecter. Dr. Chilton will go over the physical procedure you use to deal with him. Don't deviate from it. Do not deviate from it one iota for any reason. If Lecter talks to you at all, he'll just be trying to find out about you. It's the kind of curiosity that makes a snake look in a bird's nest. We both know you have to back and forth a little in interviews, but you tell him no specifics about yourself. You don't want any of your personal facts in his head. You know what he did with Will Graham. I read about it when it happened. He cut up Will with a linoleum knife. It's a wonder he didn't die. His face looks like damn Picasso drew him, thanks to Lecter. And he tore a nurse up in the hospital. Just do your job, and don't ever forget that you're dealing with a monster. I didn't pick you out of a hat, darling. I remembered that you asked me a couple of interesting questions after my seminar. Our director will see your own report over your signature, if it's clear and tight and organized. I decide that, and I will have it by 0900 Sunday. Okay, Starling, carry on in the prescribed manner. Crawford smiled at her, but his eyes were dead. Dr. Frederick Chilton, 58, administrator of the Baltimore State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, has a long, wide desk upon which there are no hard or sharp objects. Some of the staff call it the moat. Other staff members don't know what the word moat means. Dr. Chilton remained seated behind his desk when Clarice Starling came into his office. We've had a lot of detectives here, but I can't remember one so attractive. Starling knew intuitively that the shine on his extended hand was lanolin from patting his hair. She let go before he did. It is Miss Sterling, isn't it? It's Starling, Doctor, with an A. Thank you for your time. So the FBI is going to the girls like everything else. <laughs> the Bureau's improving, Dr. Chilton, it certainly is. Will you be in Baltimore for several days? You know you can have a good time here if you know the town. She looked away to spare herself his smile and knew at once that he had registered her distaste. My instructions are to see Dr. Lecter and report back this afternoon. I see, Chilton said. Give me your identification, please. He let her remain standing through his leisurely examination of her ID card. Then he handed it back and rose. This won't take much time. Come along. It was my understanding that you'd brief me, Dr. Chilton. I can do that while we walk. I have a lunch in half an hour. Clarice Starling flinched as the first of the heavy steel gates clashed shut behind her and the bolt shot home. Chilton walked slightly ahead, down the green institutional corridor, in an atmosphere of Lysol and distant slammings. Lecter's a pure sociopath, Chilton said over his shoulder. That's obviously what he is, but he's impenetrable, much too sophisticated for the standard tests. And my, does he hate us. He thinks I'm his nemesis. Crawford's very clever, isn't he? Using you on Lecter, a young woman to turn him on. We find that women are generally trouble in detention. Fuck off, Chilton, she said to herself. I graduated from the University of Virginia with honors, doctor. It's not a charm school. Then you should be able to remember the rules. Do not reach through the bars. Do not touch the bars. You pass him nothing but soft paper. No pens, no pencils. He has his own felt-tipped pens some of the time. The paper you pass him must be free of staples, paper clips, or pens. Items are only passed to him through the sliding food carrier. Items come back out the same way. No exceptions. Do not accept anything he attempts to hold out to you through the barrier. Do you understand me? I understand. They had passed through two more gates and left any natural light behind. Lecter is never outside his cell without wearing full restraints in a mouthpiece, Chilton said. I'm going to show you why. He was a model of cooperation for the first year after he was committed. Security around him was slightly relaxed. This was under the previous administration, you understand. On the afternoon of July 8, 1976, he complained of chest pain and was taken to the dispensary. 
His restraints were removed to make it easier to give him an electrocardiogram. When the nurse bent over him, he did this to her. Chilton handed Clarice Starling a dog-eared photograph. The doctors managed to save one of her eyes. Lecter was hooked up to the monitors the entire time. He broke her jaw to get at her tongue. His pulse never got over 85, even when he swallowed it. Starling didn't know which was worse. The photograph or Chilton's attention as he gleaned her face with fast, grubby eyes. She thought of a thirsty chicken pecking tears off her face. I keep him in here, Chilton said, and pushed a button beside heavy double doors of security glass. A big orderly let them into the block beyond. I don't expect I'll see you again, Miss Starling. Barney, when she's finished with Lecter, ring for someone to bring her out. Chilton left without looking at her again. Now there was only the big, impassive orderly and the soundless clock behind him and a wire mesh cabinet with the mace, restraints, mouthpiece, and tranquilizer gun. A wall rack held a long pipe device with a U on the end for pinioning the violent to the wall. The orderly was looking at her. Don't touch the bars, okay? It's past the others, the last cell on the right. Stay toward the middle of the corridor as you go down and don't mind anything. You can take him his mail. Get off on the right foot. Clarice Starling was aware of figures in the cells as she moved down the long corridor, but she tried not to look at them. She was more than halfway down when a voice hissed, I can smell your cunt. She gave no sign that she had heard it and went on. Dr. Hannibal Lecter reclined on his bunk perusing the Italian edition of Vogue. He held the loose pages in his right hand and put them beside him one by one with his left. Dr. Lecter had six fingers on his left hand. Clarice Starling stopped a little distance from the bars. Dr. Lecter? Her voice sounded all right to her. He looked up from his reading. For a steep second, she thought his gaze hummed, but it was the sound of her blood rushing. My name is Clarice Starling. May I talk with you? Dr. Lecter considered, his finger pressed against his pursed lips. Then he rose in his own time and came forward smoothly in his cage, stopping at the bars as though he chose the distance. She could see that he was small, sleek. In his hands and arms, she saw wiry strength like her own. Good morning, he said as though he had answered the door. She came a measured distance closer to the bars. The hair on her forearms rose and pressed against her sleeves. Doctor, we have a difficult problem with some specific psychological profiling. I want to ask you for your help. We, being behavioral science at Quantico, you're one of Jack Crawford's, I expect. I am, yes. May I see your credentials? I showed them at the office. You could be a reporter Chilton let in for money. I think I'm entitled to see your credentials. All right. She held her laminated ID card. I can't read it at this distance. Send it through, please. I can't. Because it's hard. Yes. Ask Barney. The orderly came and considered. Dr. Lecter, I'll let this come through, but if you don't return it when I ask you to, if we have to bother everybody and secure you to get it, then I'll be upset. If you upset me, you'll have to stay bundled up until I feel better towards you. Meals through the tube, dignity pants change twice a day, the works, and I'll hold your mail for a week. Got it? Certainly, Barney. The card rolled through on the tray, and Dr. Lecter held it to the light. A trainee? Jack Crawford sent a trainee to interview me? He tapped the card against his small white teeth and breathed in its smell. Dr. Lecter? Of course. He put the card back in the tray carrier, and Barney pulled it through. I'm still in training at the academy, yes, but we're not discussing the FBI. We're talking about psychology. Can you decide for yourself if I'm qualified in what we talk about? Hmm. That's rather slippery of you. What 
did Meg say to you? Who? Multiple Migs in the cell down there. What was it? He said, I can smell your cunt. I see. I myself cannot. You use Evian skin cream, and sometimes you wear l'air du temps, but not today. Today you are determinedly unperfumed. How do you feel about what Mig said? I'm sorry he's disturbed. Beyond that, he's just noise. How did you know about the perfume? A puff from your bag when you got out your card. Your bag is lovely. Thank you. You brought your best one, didn't you? Yes. It was true. She had saved for the classic casual handbag, and it was the best item she owned. It's much better than your shoes. Maybe they'll catch up. I have no doubt of it. Did you do the drawings on your walls, doctor? Do you think I called in a decorator? The one over the sink is a European city? It's Florence. That's the Palazzo Vecchio and the Duomo, seen from the Belvedere. Did you do it from memory, all the detail? Memory, Officer Starling, is what I have instead of a view. How is Will Graham? How does he look? I don't know, Will Graham. You know who he is. Jack Crawford's protege. The one before you. How does his face look? I've never seen him. This is called cutting up a few old touches, Officer Starling. You don't mind, do you? Better than that, we could touch up a few old cuts here. I brought... No, no, that's stupid and wrong. Never use wit in a segue. Listen, understanding a witticism and replying to it makes your subject perform a fast, detached scan that is inimical to mood. It is on the plank of mood that we proceed... You were doing fine. You'd been courteous and receptive to courtesy. You'd established trust by telling the embarrassing truth about Migs. And then you come in with a ham-handed transition into your questionnaire. It won't do. Dr. Lecter, you're an experienced clinical psychiatrist. Do you think I'm dumb enough to try to run some kind of mood scam on you? Give me some credit. I'm asking you to respond to the questionnaire, and you will or you won't. Jack Crawford is anxious for you. Crawford, the Stoic, is anxious. He must be busy if he's recruiting help from the student body. He is, and he wants busy with Buffalo Bill. I expect so. No, not I expect so, Officer Starling. You know perfectly well it's Buffalo Bill. I thought Jack Crawford might have sent you to ask me about that. No. Then you're not working around to it? No, I came because we need... What do you know about Buffalo Bill? Nobody knows much. Has everything been in the papers? I think so, Dr. Lecter. I haven't seen any confidential material on that case. My job is... How many women has Buffalo Bill used? The police have found five. All flayed? Partially, yes. The papers have never explained his name. Do you know why he's called Buffalo Bill? Yes. Tell me. I'll tell you if you'll look at this questionnaire. I'll look. That's all. Now why? They call him Buffalo Bill because he skins his humps. Starling discovered that she had traded feeling frightened for feeling cheap. Of the two, she preferred feeling frightened. Send through the questionnaire. Starling rolled the papers through on the tray. She was still while Lecter flipped through it. He dropped it back in the carrier. Oh, Officer Starling, do you think you can dissect me with this blunt little tool? No, I think you can provide some insight and advance this study. You'd like to quantify me, Officer Starling. You're so ambitious, aren't you? 
Do you know what you look like to me with your good bag and your cheap shoes? You look like a rube. You're a well-scrubbed, hustling rube with a little taste. Your eyes are like cheap birthstones. All surface shine when you stalk some little answer. And you're bright behind them, aren't you? Desperate not to be like your mother. Good nutrition has given you some length of bone, but you're not more than one generation out of the mines, Officer Starling. Is it the West Virginia Starlings or the Oakey Starlings, Officer? It was a toss-up between college and the opportunities in the Women's Army Corps, wasn't it? Starling raised her head to face him. You see a lot, Dr. Lecter. I won't deny anything you've said. But here's the question you're answering for me right now, whether you mean to or not. Are you strong enough to point that high-powered perception at yourself? It's hard to face. I found that out in the last few minutes. How about it? Look at yourself and write down the truth. What more fit or complex subject could you find? Or maybe you're afraid of yourself. You're tough. Aren't you, Officer Starling? Reasonably so, yes. And you'd hate to think you were common. Wouldn't that sting? My. Well, you're far from common, Officer Starling. All you have is fear of it. I've been thinking about Valentine's Day. Only a week away. I could make you very happy on Valentine's Day, Clarice Starling. How, Dr. Lecter? By sending you a wonderful valentine. I'll have to think about it. Now, please excuse me. Goodbye, Officer Starling. And the study? A census taker tried to quantify me once. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a big amarone. Go back to school, little Starling. Hannibal Lecter, polite to the last, did not give her his back. He stepped backward from the barrier before he turned to his cot again, and lying on it, became as remote from her as a stone crusader lying on a tomb. She took longer than necessary to put the papers back in her briefcase because she didn't immediately trust her legs. Starling was soaked with the failure she detested. She started back down the corridor feeling empty, as though she had given blood. Close beside her, Mig's voice. I bit my wrist so I can die. See how it bleeds. Startled, she turned to look into the cell, saw Miggs flick his fingers and felt the warm spatter on her cheek. She moved away from him, registering that it was semen, not blood, and that Lecter's voice was calling to her. She stopped. What in God's name do I want this bad? She thought. Clarice Starling stood in front of Lecter's cell and knew that he could smell it on her. He could smell everything. I would not have had that happen to you. Discourtesy is unspeakably ugly to me. But I'll make you happy that you came. I'll give you something. I'll give you what you love the most, Clarice Starling. What's that, Dr. Lecter? Advancement, of course. It works out perfectly. I'm so glad. Valentine's Day made me think of it. The smile over his small white teeth could have come for any reason. Look in Raspail's car for your Valentine. You'd better go now. I don't think Miggs could manage again so soon, even if he is crazy. Do you? Clarice Starling was excited, depleted, running on her will. Some of the things Lecter had said about her were true, and some only clanged on the truth. For a few seconds, she had felt an alien consciousness loose in her head, slapping things off the shelves like a bear in a camper. She hated what he'd said about her mother, and she had to get rid of the anger. This was business. She drove her old Pinto back to Quantico, back to behavioral science with its homey brown-checked curtains and its gray files full of hell, she sat there into the evening, cranking through the Lecter microfilm. Raspail, Benjamin René, white male, 
46, was first flutist for the Baltimore Philharmonic Orchestra. He was a patient in Dr. Hannibal Lecter's psychiatric practice. On March 22, 1975, he failed to appear for a performance in Baltimore. On March 25, his body was discovered seated in a pew in a small rural church near Falls Church, Virginia, dressed only in a white tie and a tailcoat. Autopsy revealed that Raspael's heart was pierced and his thymus and pancreas, gastronomically referred to as the sweetbreads, had been removed. Baltimore Homicide believed that these items appeared on the menu of a dinner Lecter gave for the president and the conductor of the Baltimore Philharmonic on the evening following Raspail's disappearance. Dr. Hannibal Lecter professed to know nothing about these matters. The two dinner guests testified that they could not recall the fare at Dr. Lecter's, though the psychiatrist was known for the excellence of his table. The president of the Philharmonic subsequently was treated for anorexia, and alcohol dependency at a sanitarium in Switzerland. Raspael was Lecter's ninth known victim. The musician died intestate, and the court had appointed his lawyer, Everett Yao, to be executor of his estate. Starling would have to apply to him to get at the car, and she needed advice as well as authorization. She dialed Crawford's home number. Jack Crawford? This is Clarice Starling. I hope you weren't eating dinner. She had to continue into silence. Lecter told me something about the Raspael case today. I'm in the office following it up. He tells me there's something in the musician's car. I wanted to ask you if... Starling, do you have any recollection of what I told you to do with the Lecter information? Give you a report by 0900 Sunday. Do that, Starling. Do just exactly that. The dial tone stung in her ear. Starling, scrubbed shiny and wearing her FBI Academy nightgown, was working on the second draft of her report when her dormitory roommate, Ardelia Mapp, came in from the library. Mapp's broad, brown, eminently sane countenance was one of the more welcome sights of her day. Ardelia Mapp saw the fatigue in her face. What did you do today, girl? Mapp always asked questions as if the answers could make no possible difference. Wheedle a crazy man with cum all over me. I wish I had time for a social life. I don't know how you manage it. And school, too. Starling found that she was laughing. Ardelia Mapp laughed with her, as much as the small joke was worth. On Monday morning, Clarice Starling found the following message from Crawford. C.S. Colon. Proceed on the Raspail car. On your own time. Report Wednesday, 1600 hours. The director got your lector report over your signature. You did well. Starling felt pretty good. She knew Crawford was just giving her an exhausted mouse to bat around for practice, but he wanted to teach her. He wanted her to do well. For Starling, that beat courtesy every time. Raspail had been dead for eight years. It seemed unlikely that his estate would have held on to the car or that any evidence could have lasted that long. There was also the problem of time. Counting her lunch breaks and study periods over the next three days, Starling had a total of three hours and 45 minutes to trace the vehicle. During her Monday lunch, personnel at the Baltimore County Courthouse confirmed that permission had been granted for the sale of the Raspail Auto and gave Starling the make and serial number of the car, as well as the name of a subsequent owner. On Tuesday, she wasted half her lunch hour trying to chase down the car. By Wednesday afternoon, as Starling sat in a phone booth during her study period, a voice of the Arkansas Hills confirmed that the Raspail automobile had been stripped and pressed into a cube at his salvage yard. Shithouse mouse, thought Starling, not entirely out of her own country accent. Dead end. Some valentine. Starling rested her head against the cold coin box in the telephone booth. Ardelia Mapp, her books on her hip, pecked on the door of the booth and handed in an orange crush. Much obliged, Ardelia. I gotta make one more call. If I can get done with that in time, I'll catch up with you in the cafeteria, okay? I was so in hopes you'd overcome that ghastly dialect, Mapp said. Books are available to help you. I never use the colorful patois of my housing project anymore. You come talking that much mouth, people say you eat up with a dumbass girl. Mapp closed the phone booth door. Later that afternoon, Starling was back in Jack Crawford's office. Your friend Miggs is dead, he said. Swallowed his tongue sometime before daylight. 
Chilton thinks Lecter suggested it to him. It seems the overnight orderly heard Miggs and Lecter talking softly. Did you tell me everything, Starling? Yes, sir. Between the report and my memo, there's everything, almost verbatim. She felt numb, and she had to handle it. Chilton called up to complain about you. Crawford waited, and seemed pleased when she didn't ask why. I told him I found your behavior satisfactory. Crawford laced his fingers over his stomach and compared his thumbs. Lecter asked you about me, didn't he? He asked if you were busy. I said yes. You don't think I traded some kind of gossip and that's why he talked to me? No, I'm satisfied. Next item. You thought something or proceed to the next item, Starling. Lecter's hint about Raspael's car is a dead end. It was mashed into a cube and sold for recycling. Why do you think the car Raspail drove was his only automobile? It was the only one registered. He was single, I assumed. You assumed, Starling? He leaned back, pleased. Raspail collected old cars. Did you know that? No. Does the estate still have them? I don't know. Do you think you could manage to find out? Yes, I can. Where would you start? His executor. Everett Yao, Crawford said. A lawyer in Baltimore, I seem to remember. Tell you what. I'll advise the Baltimore field office you'll be up there. Saturday, Starling. On your own time. It was almost dark. Starling's day as an investigator was nearly gone, and she didn't have another day to replace it. The lost time was not Everett Yao's fault. Returning in the rainy late afternoon from a week-long business trip, the Baltimore lawyer had come directly from the airport to meet Starling at the mini-storage facility. Starling was enjoying the use for one day of an FBI motor pool Plymouth with a cellular telephone, and she had a new ID card provided by Crawford. It simply said, Federal Investigator, and expired in a week. It doesn't appear to have been opened since I was here five years ago, he said. You see the impression of my notary seal here in the plastic. Yao held the flashlight and umbrella in the early dark, while Starling took a picture of the lock and seal. Yao tried a key. The locks may be frozen, at least this one's very stiff. Starling was glad to see that the padlocks were big chrome American standards. They looked formidable, but she knew she could pop the brass cylinders with a sheet metal screw and a claw hammer. When she was a child, her father had shown her how burglars did it. The locks released, but the door would not come up. Starling lifted on the handle until bright spots danced before her eyes. It squealed horribly and went up a foot and a half where it jammed solidly. With her flashlight, she could pick out cardboard boxes and one big tire with a wide white wall beneath the edge of a cloth cover. The tire was flat. Starling put one of the Plymouth's rubber floor mats on the wet ground in front of the door and lay down on it, her hand cupping a pack of plastic evidence bags over the lens of her camera. She fastened the collar button of her blouse, scrunched her shoulders up around her neck, and slid under the door. The car was big, tall, and long. A 1938 Packard limousine, according to Yao's inventory. It was covered with a rug, the plush side down. She played her flashlight over it. The rug was thick and heavy, and as she tugged at it, dust swarmed in the beam of her flashlight. She sneezed twice. Standing on tiptoe, she could fold the rug over to the midline of the tall, old car. Starling leaned over boxes to put her face close to the glass and shined her light through the crack. She could only see her reflection until she cupped her hand on top of the light. A splinter of the beam, diffused by the dusty glass, moved across the seat. An album lay open on the seat. The colors were poor in the bad light, but she could see valentines pasted on the pages. Lacy old valentines, fluffy on the page. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lecter. The light moved on, over a lap rug crumpled on the floor of the car, and onto the dusty wink of a pair of men's patent leather evening shoes. Above the shoes, black socks, and above the socks, tuxedo trousers.
with legs in them. Nobody's been in here five years. Easy, easy, hold it, baby. She wished she had thought to oil the Packard key before she came under the door, but when she stuck it in the lock, it worked. Now is more important than all the crap you tell your pillow for the rest of your life. Suck it up and do this right. There was hardly room to open the door more than a third of the way in the narrow passage. A stale smell of decay and chemical came out of the car. It jogged her memory in a place she couldn't name. She leaned inside, opened the partition behind the chauffeur's seat, and shined her flashlight into the rear compartment of the car. A formal shirt with studs was the bright thing the light found first. Quickly up the shirt front to the face. No face to see. And down again, over glittering shirt studs and satin lapels, to a lap with a zipper open. And up again to the neat bow tie and the collar, where the white stub neck of a mannequin protruded. But above the neck, something else something that reflected little light. Cloth, a black hood where the head should be, big as though it covered a parrot's cage. Velvet, Starling thought. It sat on a plywood shelf extending over the neck of the mannequin. She took several pictures from the front seat, closing her eyes against the flash of the strobe. She reached through the chauffeur's partition, unlocked the rear door, and carefully lifted the Valentine album into an evidence bag. The smell from the rear compartment was much stronger. The car springs groaned as she got into the back seat, and the figure shifted a little when she sat down beside it. The right hand in its white glove slid off the thigh and lay on the seat. She touched the glove with her finger. The hand inside was hard. Gingerly, she pushed the glove down from the wrist. The wrist was some white synthetic material. There was a lump in the trousers that for a silly instant reminded her of certain events in high school. Gentle as a caress, her hand touched the hood. The cloth slid easily over something hard and slick beneath. When she felt the round knob on the top, she knew. She knew that it was a big laboratory specimen jar, and she knew what would be in it. With dread, but little doubt, she pulled off the cover. The head inside the jar had been severed neatly beneath the jaw. It faced her, the eyes long burned milky by the alcohol that preserved it. The mouth was open, and the tongue protruded slightly, very gray. Over the years, the alcohol had evaporated to the point that the head was resting on the bottom of the jar, its crown protruding through the surface of the fluid in a cap of decay. Turned at an owlish angle to the body beneath, it gaped stupidly at Starling. Even in the play of light over the features, it remained dumb and dead. Starling was pleased and exhilarated. Now, at this moment, sitting in this old car with a severed head, she could think clearly and was proud of that. Working carefully, disturbing the figure as little as possible, she frisked it for identification. There was none. She poked the lump in the trousers. Too hard, even for high school, she reflected. She spread the fly with her fingers and shined her light inside illuminating a dildo of polished inlaid wood. Good-sized one, too. She wondered if she was depraved. Carefully, she rotated the jar and examined the sides and back of the head for wounds. There were none visible. Contemplating the face again, she believed she learned something that would endure. Looking with purpose at this face, its tongue changing color where it touched the glass, was not as bad as her dreams of Miggs swallowing his tongue. She felt she could look at anything if she had something positive to do about it. Starling was young. The odors of the violent ward seemed more intense in the semi-darkness. 
A TV set playing without sound in the corridor threw Starling's shadow on the bars of Dr. Lecter's cage. Starling knew Lecter was watching her from the darkness. Two minutes passed. Her legs and back ached from her struggle with the garage door, and her clothes were damp. She sat on the floor, her feet tucked under her, and lifted her wet, bedraggled hair over her collar to get it off her neck. After five minutes, she said, It was strange going in there. Sometime I'd like to talk to you about it. Starling jumped when the food carrier rolled out of Lecter's cell. There was a clean, folded towel in the tray. She hadn't heard him move. She looked at it, and with a sense of falling, took it and toweled her hair. Thanks. Why don't you ask me about Buffalo Bill? Lecter's voice was close, at her level. He must be sitting on the floor, too. Do you know something about him? I might, if I saw the case file. I don't have that case. Now, Dr. Lecter, please tell me about the person in the Packard. You found an entire person? Odd. I only saw a head. Where do you suppose the rest came from? All right. Whose head was it? What can you tell? They've only done the preliminary stuff. White male, about 27, both American and European dentistry. Who was he? Raspael's lover. Raspael of the gluey flute. What were the circumstances? How did he die? Circumlocution, Officer Starling. No, I'll ask it later. Let me save you some time. I didn't do it. Raspael did. He liked sailors. This was a Swedish one named Klaus something. Raspael met him one summer while he was teaching in San Diego and went berserk over him. The Swedes saw a good thing and jumped ship. They bought some kind of awful camper and sylphed through the woods naked. Raspael said the young man was unfaithful, and he strangled him. Raspael told you this? Oh, yes, under the confidential seal of therapy sessions. I think it was a lie. Raspael always embellished the facts. The Swede probably died in some banal erotic asphyxia transaction. Notice how closely Klaus was trimmed under the jaw, probably to remove a high ligature mark from hanging. And then Raspael himself died. Why? Frankly, I got sick and tired of his whining. Best thing for him, really. And your dinner for the orchestra officials? Haven't you ever had people coming over in no time to shop? You have to make do with what's in the fridge, Clarice. May I call you Clarice? Yes, I think I'll just call you Dr. Lecter. That seems most appropriate to your age and station, he said. Tell me, Clarice, why do you think I helped you? I don't know. Do you think it's because I like to look at you and think about eating you up? About how you would taste? Is that the reason? No. I want something Jack Crawford can give me, and I want to trade him for it. But he won't ask for my help with Buffalo Bill. Even though he knows it means more young women will die. Lecter slowly turned up the rheostat for the light in his cell. His books and drawings were gone. His toilet seat was gone. Chilton had stripped the place to punish him for Miggs. I've been in this room eight years, Clarice, and I know they will never let me out. What I want is very simple. I want a view, a window in a federal institution where I can see a tree or even water and I want my books back. I'll give Crawford good value for it. Ask him. I can tell him what you've said. He'll ignore it. And Buffalo Bill will go on and on. Wait until he scalps one and see how you like it. 
Hmm. I'll tell you one thing about Buffalo Bill without ever seeing the case. And years from now, when they catch him, if they ever do, you'll see that I was right, and I could have helped. Clarice? Yes? Buffalo Bill has a two-story house. Clarice Darling leaned against a dice table in the FBI's casino and tried to pay attention to a lecture on money laundering and gambling. It had been 36 hours since she slid under the door of the storage unit and made her startling discovery. Now she found herself in a curious state of suspension, having received no word from Crawford or the Baltimore field office. It was as though she had dropped her report down a hole. Starlin, over here was John Brigham, the ex-Marine firearms instructor, beckoning to her from the doorway. Saddle up. You're going with Jack Crawford today. Take stuff for overnight. He was carrying the big fingerprint kit from the property room and a small canvas bag. Where? Some duck hunters in Potter, West Virginia, found a body in the Elk River around daylight in a Buffalo Bill-type situation. Brigham stopped at the door to her dormitory. You were a grunt in the lab. Jack Crawford needs somebody who can print a floater, among other things. The gunnery instructor held the fingerprint kit open while Starling checked its contents. The fine hypodermics, vials, and Polaroid were there. You don't have a duty piece yet, right? No. You gotta have a full kit, speed loader and all. This is the rig you've been wearing on the range. The gun is my own. It's the same type Smith & Wesson you've trained with. You got some aptitude, Starling. If you have to shoot, you can shoot. I know it, and so do you. Listen, there's no head in the blue canoe, so go to the bathroom while you got the chance. I'll be in a car behind this wing in ten minutes flat. Chop, chop, Starlin. She tried to ask him a question, but he was already out the door. Has to be Buffalo Bill if Crawford's going himself. What the hell is the blue canoe? Starling packed fast and well. A venerable twin-engine beach craft stood on the taxiway at the Quantico airstrip with its beacons turning and the door open. That wouldn't be the blue canoe, Starling said. Yep. Brigham pulled beside the airplane and got Starling's baggage out of the back. If you're working with Crawford, you should know what the deal is with him. He's got a lot on his mind. His wife Bella's real sick, a terminal situation. He's caring for her at home. If it wasn't for Buffalo Bill, he'd have taken compassionate leave. I didn't know that. It's not disgust. Don't tell him you're sorry or anything. Don't help. I'm glad you told me. And then, without meaning to, Brigham said, Bless you, Starling. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Brigham. Crawford was in the co-pilot's seat in shirt sleeves and sunglasses. He turned to Starling when he heard the pilot slam the door. Take a pew and read. A thick case file lay on the seat behind him. The cover said, Buffalo Bill. Starling hugged it tight as the blue canoe blatted and shuddered and began to roll. The edges of the runway blurred and fell away. She opened the file. Buffalo Bill had done it five times that they knew of, at least five times, and probably more over the past ten months. He had abducted a woman, killed her, and skinned her. Each body was found in a river downstream from an interstate highway crossing, and each in a different state. Everyone knew Buffalo Bill was a traveling man. That was all the law knew about him, except for the fact that he had at least one gun, possibly a Colt revolver. Rivers left no fingerprints, no trace evidence such as hair or fiber. He was almost certain to be a white male, white because serial murderers usually kill within their racial group, and all the victims were white, male because female serial murderers are almost unknown in our time. There was no clear correlation between where Bill abducted the young women and where he dumped them. In the cases where the bodies were found soon enough for an accurate determination of time of death, Police learned something else the killer did. Buffalo Bill kept his women for a while. Alive. These victims did not die until a week to ten days after they were abducted. That meant he had to have a place to keep them, and a place to work in privacy. It meant he wasn't a drifter. He was more of a trapdoor spider, with his own digs. Somewhere. Two victims were hanged, three shot. There was no evidence of rape or physical abuse prior to death, and the autopsy recorded no evidence of specifically genital disfigurement. All were found naked. 
In two cases, articles of the victim's outer clothing were found beside the road near their homes, slit up the back, like a funeral suit. Starling managed to get through the photographs. If she wanted to stop Buffalo Bill, she was in the right crowd. Jack Crawford had organized successful hunts for three serial murderers, but not without casualties. Will Graham, the keenest hound ever to run in Crawford's pack, now had a face that was hard to look at. Crawford climbed out of the co-pilot's seat and buckled in beside her. He opened his file to a map of the central and eastern United States. Locations where bodies had been found were marked on it. Crawford took a pen from his pocket and marked the newest location, their objective. Elk River, about six miles below US-79. We're lucky on this one. The body was snagged on a fishing line. They don't think she's been in the water all that long. They're bringing her to Potter, the county seat. I want to know who she is fast so we can sweep for any witnesses to the abduction. We'll send the prince back on a landline as soon as we get him. Crawford tilted his head to look at Starling through the bottoms of his glasses. Can you do a floater? I can print a floater very well, in fact, good. Now look at this. His first victim that we know of was Frederica Bemmel, who in mid-April had been reported missing from her home in Belvedere, Ohio. Two months later, she was found in the Blackwater River in Missouri, outside of Lone Jack but it took us another three months just to get her identified. The next one he grabbed in Chicago, the third week in April. She was found in the Wabash in downtown Lafayette, Indiana, just ten days after she was taken, so we could tell what had happened to her. Next, we've got a white female, early twenties, dumped in the Rolling Fork near I-65, about 38 miles south of Louisville, Kentucky. She's never been identified. And the Varner woman was grabbed in Evansville, Indiana, and dropped in the Ambra, just below Interstate 70 in eastern Illinois. Then he moved south and dumped one in the Conasauga below Damascus, Georgia, down from Interstate 75. That was this Kitteridge girl from Pittsburgh. Here's her graduation picture. His luck's ungodly. Nobody's ever seen him make a snatch. Except for the dumps being near an interstate, we haven't seen any pattern. If you trace heaviest traffic routes backward from the dump sites, do they converge at all? No. What if you postulate that he's making a drop-off and a new abduction on the same trip? Starling asked carefully avoiding the forbidden word, assume. That's a good idea. If he is doing both things in one trip, he's zigging around. We run computer simulations, first with him westbound on the interstates, then eastbound, then various combinations with the best dates we can put on the dumps and abductions. You put it in the computer and smoke comes out. He lives in the east, it tells us. He's not in a moon cycle, it tells us. No convention dates in the cities correlate, and he's definitely too careful to be considered a suicide. No, he's seen us coming. Clarice Starling's stomach lifted as the airplane started its descent for landing. Couple of things, Starling. I look for first-rate forensics from you, but I need more than that. You don't say much, and that's okay, neither do I. But don't ever feel you've got to have a new fact to tell me before you can bring something up. There aren't any silly questions. You'll see things that I won't, and I want to know what they are. Maybe you've got a knack for this. All of a sudden, we've got this chance to see if you do. Listening to him with her expression properly wrapped, Starling wondered how long Crawford had known he'd use her on this case, how hungry for a chance he had wanted her to be. The pilot lifted an earphone and spoke over his shoulder. Final approach, Jack. You staying back there? Yeah. School's out, Starling. In the private parking lot behind the Potter funeral home where the hearses waited, Two young deputies and one old one stood with two state troopers under a bare elm. It was not cold enough for their breath to steam. Starling looked at these men as the cruiser pulled into the lot. The deputies watched her side long as she passed. One said, Ma'am? She gave them a nod and a smile of the correct dim wattage as she went to join Crawford on the back porch. They had moved into the funeral home's dim back corridor. So in an embalming room, with cabbage roses in the wallpaper, and a picture molding beneath its high ceiling, in a white frame house of a type she understood, Clarice Starling met with her first direct evidence of Buffalo Bill. The bright green body bag, tightly zipped, was the only modern object in the room. It lay on an old-fashioned porcelain embalming table, reflected many times in the glass panes of cabinets holding trokers and packages of rock-hard cavity fluid. Crawford went to the car for the fingerprint transmitter while Starling unpacked her equipment on the drain board of a large double sink against the wall. Too many people were in the room, several deputies, 
the chief deputy, all had wandered in with them and showed no inclination to leave. It wasn't right. Why didn't Crawford come on and get rid of them? Clarice Starling, standing at the sink, needed now a prototype of courage more apt and powerful than any marine parachute jump. The image came to her and helped her, but it pierced her too. Her mother, standing at the sink, washing blood out of her father's hat, running cold water over the hat, saying, We'll be all right, Clarice. Tell your brothers and sister to wash up and come to the table. We need to talk and then we'll fix her supper. Starling took off her scarf and tied it over her hair like a mountain midwife. She took a pair of surgical gloves out of her kit. When she opened her mouth for the first time in Potter, her voice had more than its normal twang, and the force of it brought Crawford to the door to listen. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you officers and gentlemen, listen here a minute, please. Now let me take care of her. She held her hands before their faces as she pulled on the gloves. There's things we need to do for her. You brought her this far, and I know her folks would thank you if they could. Now please go on out and let me take care of her. Crawford saw them suddenly go quiet and respectful and urge each other out in whispers. Come on, Jess, let's go on out in the yard. And Crawford saw that the atmosphere had changed here in the presence of the dead, that wherever this victim came from, whoever she was, the river had carried her into the country, and while she lay helpless in this room in the country, Clarice Starling had a special relationship to her. Then there were only Crawford and Starling, and the doctor in the room with the victim. She dug her cameras out of the equipment bag on the drain board, her back to the room. Behind her, she heard the zipper of the body bag go down. Starling blinked at the cabbage roses on the wall, took a deep breath, turned around, and looked at the body on the table. The victim was a heavy-hipped young woman, 67 inches long by Starling's tape. The water had leached her gray where the skin was gone, but it had been cold water, and she clearly hadn't been in it more than a few days. The body was flayed neatly from a clean line just below the breast to the knees, about the area that would be covered by a bullfighter's pants and sash. Her breasts were small, and between them, over the sternum, was the apparent cause of death, a ragged, star-shaped wound a hand's breadth across. Her round head was peeled to the skull, from just above the eyebrows and ears to the nape. Dr. Lecter said he'd start scalping, Starling said. Crawford stood with his arms folded while she photographed the body. What do you see, Starling? Well, she's not a local. Her ears are pierced three times each, and she wore a glitter polish. Looks like town to me. She's got maybe two weeks or so hair growth on her legs. And see how soft it's grown in? I think she got her legs waxed. Armpits, too. Look how she bleached the fuzz on her upper lip. She was pretty careful about herself, but she hasn't been able to take care of it for a while. What about the wound? I don't know. I would have said a gunshot exit wound, except that it looks like part of an abrasion collar and a muzzle stamp at the top there. Good, Starling. It's a contact entrance wound over the sternum. The explosion gases expand between the bone and the skin and blow out the star around the hole. She's got two nails broken off here on the left hand. Starling continued. They're broken back up in the quick, and it looks like dirt or some hard particles driven up under some of the others. Take samples of the grit and a couple of flakes of nail polish, Crawford said. Lamar, a lean funeral home assistant with a whiskey bloom in the middle of his face, came in while she was doing it. You must have been a manicurist one time, he said. They were glad to see the young woman had no fingernail marks in her palms an indication that, like the others, she had died before anything else was done to her. You want to print her face down, Starling? Crawford said. It'd be easier. Well, let's do teeth first, and then Lamar can help us turn her over. At Starling's direction, Lamar gently opened the young woman's mouth and retracted her lips, while Starling placed the Polaroid against the face to get details of the front teeth. That part was easy, but she had to shoot the molars with a palatal reflector, watching from the side for the glow through the cheek to be sure the strobe around the lens was lighting the inside of the mouth. 
Starling watched the first Polaroid print of the molars develop. She's got something in her throat, Starling said. Crawford looked at the picture. It showed a dark cylindrical object just behind the soft palate. Give me the flashlight. When a body comes out of the water, a lot of times there's like leaves and things in the mouth, Lamar said, helping Crawford to look. Starling took some forceps out of her bag. She looked at Crawford across the body. He nodded. It only took her a second to get it. What is it, some kind of seed pod? Crawford said. No, nah, sir. That's a bug cocoon, Lamar said. He was right. Starling put it in a jar and continued her work. Face down, the body was easy to fingerprint. Starling had been prepared for the worst, but none of the tedious and delicate injection methods or finger stalls were necessary. Two triangular pieces of skin were missing from high on the shoulders. Starling took pictures. She felt the urge to say something before they zipped up the bag, to make a gesture or express some kind of commitment. In the end, she just shook her head and got busy packing the samples into her case. By the time Starling had finished taping a memo to the pathologist across the zipper of the body bag, Crawford's fingerprint transmitter was clicking on the office desk. Drop me at the lab, Jeff, Crawford told the driver. Then I want you to wait for Officer Starling at the Smithsonian. She'll go on from there to Quantico. Yes, sir. They were crossing the Potomac River, coming into downtown Washington from the airport. Crawford was not in a good humor. Nine hours had passed since he transmitted the fingerprints and pictures of the victim, and she remained unidentified. I'll post the hotline and latent descriptor index when I take your prints up to ID, Crawford said. The latent descriptor index in the identification section's computer compares the characteristics of a crime under investigation to the known proclivities of criminals on file. When it finds pronounced similarities, it suggests suspects and produces their fingerprints. Then a human operator compares the file fingerprints with latent prints found at the scene. There were no prints yet on Buffalo Bill, but Crawford wanted to be ready. You draft me an insert for the file. Do you know how to do it? Crawford said. I know how. Pretend I'm the index. Tell me what's new. The system requires brief, concise statements. Starling tried to come up with some. White female, late teens or early twenties, shot to death, lower torso and thighs flayed. Starling, the index already knows he kills young white women and skins their torsos. It already knows he dumps them in rivers. It doesn't know what's new here. What is new, Starling? This is the sixth victim, the first one scalped, the first one with triangular patches taken from the back of the shoulders, the first one shot in the chest, the first one with a cocoon in her throat. You forgot broken fingernails. No, sir, she's the second one with broken fingernails. You're right. Listen, in your insert for the file, note that the cocoon is confidential. We'll use it to eliminate false confessions. I'm wondering if he's done that before, placed a cocoon or an insect, Starling said. It would be easy to miss in an autopsy, especially with a floater. You know, the medical examiner sees an obvious cause of death. It's hot in there and they want to get through. Can we check back on that? I'll do it if I have to, but we'll see what you find out of the Smithsonian before I decide. Scalping. That's rare, isn't it? Uncommon, yes, Crawford said. But Dr. Lecter said Buffalo Bill would do it. How did he know that? He didn't know it. He said it, though. It's not a big surprise, darling. Certainly not to me. I should have said that scalping was rare until the Mengel case. Remember him? He scalped that woman. There were two or three copycats after that. The papers, when they were playing around with the Buffalo Bill tag, emphasized more than once that this killer didn't take scalps. It's no wonder after that. He probably follows his press. Lecter was guessing. He didn't say when it would happen, so he could never be wrong. If we caught Bill and there was no scalping, Lecter could say we got him just before he did it. Dr. Lecter also said Buffalo Bill lives in a two-story house. We never got into that. Why do you suppose he said it? That's not a guess. He's very likely right, and he could have told you why, but he wanted to tease you with it. It's the only weakness I ever saw in him. He has to look smart, smarter than anybody. He's been doing it for years. You said ask if I don't know. Well, I have to ask you to explain that. Okay. Three of the victims were hanged, right? As Dr. Lecter knows from personal experience, darling, it's very hard for one person to hang another against their will. So the way it's done is in a stairwell. 
You tell the victim you're taking them up to use the bathroom, whatever. Walk them up with a hood on, slip the noose on, and boot them off the top step with the rope fastened to the landing railing. It's the only good way in a house. A fellow in California popularized it. If Bill didn't have a stairwell, he'd kill them another way. Jeff, you can let me out here. She watched him walk away, a middle-aged man, laden with cases and rumpled from flying, his cuffs muddy from the riverbank, going home to what he did at home, going home to Bella. She would have killed for him then. That was one of Crawford's great talents. The Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History had been closed for hours, but Crawford had called ahead, and a guard waited to let Clarice Starling in the Constitution Avenue entrance. Starling followed the guard through a dim maze of corridors, walled high with wooden cases of specimens. Only the small labels revealed their contents. She was in the heart of entomology, on a rotunda gallery high above the great stuffed elephant. There she found the office with lights on and the door open. Time, Pilch, let's go here, time. Starling stopped in the doorway. Two men sat at a laboratory table playing chess. Both were about 30, one black-haired and lean, the other pudgy with wiry red hair. They appeared to be engrossed in the chessboard. If they noticed Starling, they gave no sign. I have the specimen Special Agent Crawford called about. I can't imagine why we didn't hear your siren, the pudgy one said. We're waiting all night here to identify a bug for the FBI. Bugs are all we do. Nobody said anything about Special Agent Crawford's specimen. He should show his specimen privately to his family doctor. Time, Pilch! I'd love to catch your whole routine another time, but this is urgent, so let's do it now. Time, Pilch. The black-haired one looked around at her, saw her leaning against the doorframe with her briefcase. When he got up, he was tall. I'm Noble Pilcher. That's Albert Roden. You need an insect identified? We're happy to help. You are Clarice Starling. Let's see what you've got. Pilcher held a small jar to the light. This cocoon was found lodged behind the soft pallet of a murder victim. I don't know how it got there. Her body was in the Elk River in West Virginia, and she hadn't been dead more than a few days. It's Buffalo Bill. I heard it on the radio, Roden said. So we'll do this as soon as we can, Pilcher said. Don't worry, we're good at this. You couldn't be in better hands. He removed the brown object from the jar with a slender forceps and placed it on a sheet of white paper beneath the light. He swung a magnifying glass on a flexible arm over it. Inside the cocoon was a long insect that looked like a mummy. It was sheathed in a semi-transparent cover that followed its general outlines like a sarcophagus. The appendages were bound so tightly against the body they might have been carved in low relief. The little face looked wise. In the first place, it's not anything that would normally infest a body outdoors, and it wouldn't be in the water except by accident, Pilcher said. I don't know how familiar you are with insects or how much you want to hear. <laughs> Let's say I don't know diddly. I want you to tell me the whole thing. Okay, this is a pupa, an immature insect in a chrysalis. That's the cocoon that holds it while it transforms itself from a larva into an adult. Pilcher moved the specimen to the stage of a microscope and hunkered over it with a dental probe in his hand. Okay, I'd say it's Lepidoptera. It's gonna be tough if the wings are soaked. I'll pull the references, Roden said. I guess there's no way I can keep you from talking about me while I'm gone. I guess not. Pilcher turned away from the bright light. It's a big family, Lepidoptera. Maybe 30,000 butterflies and 130,000 moths. I'd like to take it out of the chrysalis. I'll have to if we're going to narrow it down. Okay. Can you do it in one piece? I think so. Look, it had started to emerge before it died. See? There's an irregular fracture in the chrysalis right there. This may take a little while. Pilcher spread the natural split in the case and eased the insect out. The bunched wings were soaked. Spreading them was like working with a wet, wadded facial tissue. No pattern was visible. Roden was back with the books. Ready, Pilcher said. Would you turn out the light, Officer Starling? She watched Pilcher's pen light come on. When he shined it on the specimen, the insect's eyes glowed in the dark, reflecting the narrow beam. Owlet, Roden said. Probably, but which one, Pilcher said. Give us the lights, please. 
Okay, let's see you shine, Albert, my man. Roden's wiry red head covered the microscope. Arabus Odora, Roden said at last. The black witch moth. He was already turning pages. A tropical species sometimes straying up to Canada in the fall, Roden read. Indigenous West Indies, southern U.S., considered a pest in Hawaii. Fuckola, Starling thought. Nuts, she said aloud. They're all over. But they're not all over all the time. Pilcher's head was down. He pulled at his chin. Do they double brood, Roden? Wait a second. Yeah, in extreme South Florida and South Texas. When? May and August. I was just thinking, Pilcher said. Your specimen had started fracturing its cocoon to come out. In the West Indies or Hawaii, maybe, I could understand it. But it's winter here. In this country, it would wait three months to come out, unless it happened accidentally in a greenhouse or somebody raised it. Raised it how? In a cage, in a warm place with some acacia leaves for the larvae to eat until they're ready to button up in their cocoons. It's not hard to do. Is it a popular hobby? Outside professional study, do a lot of people do it? No, primarily it's entomologists trying to get a perfect specimen. Maybe a few collectors. There's the silk industry, too. They raise moths, but not this kind. Entomologists must have periodicals, professional journals, people that sell equipment, Starling said. Sure, and most of the publications come here. Let me make you a bundle in the morning, Roden said. I'll see they're picked up. Thank you, Mr. Roden. Pilcher Xeroxed the references on Arabus Odora and gave them to her along with the insect. I'll take you down, he said. They waited for the elevator. Most people love butterflies and hate moths, he said. But moths are more interesting, engaging. They're destructive. Some are. A lot are. But they live in all kinds of ways, just like we do. There's a moth, more than one in fact, that lives only on tears. That's all they eat or drink. What kind of tears? Whose tears? The tears of large land mammals. About our size. The old definition of moth was anything that gradually, silently eats, consumes, or wastes any other thing. It was a verb for destruction, too. Is this what you do all the time? Hunt Buffalo Bill? I do it all I can. Ardelia Mapp had left Starling's mail and half a mound's candy bar on her bed. Across the room, Mapp was asleep. Starling carried her portable typewriter down to the laundry room, put it on the clothes folding shelf, and cranked in a carbon set. She had organized her notes on Arabus Odora on the ride back to Quantico, and she covered that quickly. Then she ate the mounds and wrote a memo to Crawford suggesting they cross-check the entomology publication's computerized mailing lists against the FBI's known offender files and the files in the cities closest to the abductions plus felon and sex offender files of Metro Dade, San Antonio, and Houston, the areas where the moths were most plentiful. There was another thing, too, that she had to bring up for a second time. Let's ask Dr. Lecter why he thought the perpetrator would start taking scalps. She delivered the paper to the night duty officer and fell gratefully into her bed, the voices of the day still whispering. On the swarming dark, she saw the moth's wise little face, those glowing eyes, had looked at Buffalo Bill. Out of the cosmic hangover the Smithsonian leaves came her last thought and a coda for her day. Over this odd world, this half of the world that's dark now, I have to hunt a thing that lives on tears. In East Memphis, Tennessee, Catherine Baker Martin and her latest lover were watching a late movie on television in his apartment. Hand me my keys, Keith. I gotta check my machine to see if my mom called. Catherine got up from the couch, a tall young woman, big-boned and well-fleshed, nearly heavy, with a handsome face and a lot of clean, beautiful hair. The February evening was more raw than cold. A light fog off the river hung over the parking area. She started across it toward her front door a hundred yards away. A brown panel truck parked near her apartment drew her attention. A lighted floor lamp and an overstuffed armchair stood on the asphalt next to the truck. Somebody was always moving at the Stonehenge Villas. Catherine Baker Martin entered her apartment and peered out the window. A man, 
his arm in a sling, struggled with the chair in an effort to load it into the back of the vehicle. She went outside. Help you with that? Would you? Thanks. The floor lamp lit his face from below, distorting his features. But she could see that his chin and cheeks were hairless, smooth as a woman's. He had on pressed khaki trousers and some kind of chamois shirt, unbuttoned over a freckled chest. He looked at her, too, and she was sensitive to that. Men were often surprised at her size when she got close to them, and some concealed it better than others. Good, he said. Together they pushed the chair forward along the floor of the truck until it was just behind the seats. Are you about a fourteen? He said. What? Would you hand me that rope? It's just at your feet. When she bent for the rope, he brought his plastered arm down on the back of her head in a succession of blows, none too hard. She slid to the floor. The man pulled off his cast, brought the lamp into the truck, and closed the rear doors. He pulled her collar back, and with a flashlight read the size tag on her blouse. Good. Using a pair of scissors, he slit the blouse up the back, pulled it off, handcuffed her hands behind her, and rolled her onto her back. She was not wearing a brassiere. He prodded her big breasts with his fingers and felt their weight and resilience. Good. There was a pink suck mark on her left breast. He licked his finger to rub it and nodded when the lividity went away with light pressure. He rolled her onto her face and checked her scalp, parting her thick hair with his fingers. The padded cast hadn't cut her. He checked her pulse with two fingers on the side of her neck and found it strong. Good. He had a long way to drive to his two-story house, and he'd rather not field dress her here. As the truck pulled away, Catherine Baker Martin's telephone was ringing. The machine in the apartment answered, its red light blinking in the dark. The caller was Catherine's mother, the junior U.S. senator from Tennessee. Sore from a troubled sleep, Clarice Starling stood in her bathrobe and bunny slippers, towel over her shoulder, waiting to get in the bathroom she and Map shared. The radio news of the abduction from Memphis froze her for half a breath. Ear cocked to the telephone, she packed for overnight and set her forensic kit by the door. She made sure the switchboard knew she was in her room and gave up breakfast to stick by the phone. At ten minutes to class time, with no word, she hurried off. In a sullen mood, Starling watched the seven o'clock news with Map and a dozen other students in the recreation room. The story from Memphis was a rehash of the earlier news. Senator Martin's daughter was missing. Her blouse had been found slit up the back in the style of Buffalo Bill. No witnesses. The victim found in West Virginia remained unidentified. Special Agent Jack Crawford was on the scene. Back in their room, Map, rummaging among her many enthusiasms, lightened Starling's gloom by comparing slant rhymes in the works of Stevie Wonder and Emily Dickinson. The telephone rang. It was Crawford, calling from an airplane, his voice scratchy on the phone. Starling. Pack for two nights and meet me at the Smithsonian in an hour. He started talking to someone else before he punched off. Once again, the guard took Clarice Starling to the second level above the Smithsonian's great elephant. Crawford was waiting there, his hands in the pockets of his raincoat. She waited for him to say something. Catherine Martin's probably still alive, he said, and we have maybe a week. That's at the outside. Dr. Alan Bloom, our expert on the subject of serial murderers, thinks his period is getting shorter. But this time, Starling, this time we may have a little break. We've got another insect. Come, I'll show you. They rounded the corner to the door of anthropology. She went in. Three men in laboratory coats worked at a table in the center of the room beneath a brilliant light. In a stainless steel tray on the workbench was Klaus, the head she had found in Raspail's old Packard. Klaus had the bug in his throat, Crawford said. Johns Hopkins found the insect while doing the head for the Baltimore County Police. It was in the throat, just like the girl in West Virginia. You're saying maybe Buffalo Bill killed Klaus years ago? Does it seem far-fetched? Too much of a coincidence? Right this second it does. Let it cook a minute. You think maybe Dr. Lecter knows exactly how Klaus died? And it wasn't Raspail? And it wasn't erotic asphyxia? What do you think? 
I think you told me to pack for two days. You want me to ask Dr. Lecter, don't you? You're the one he talks to, Starling. Crawford looked so sad when he said, I figure you're game. She nodded. Two things to begin with. First, we go on the premise that Lecter really knows something concrete. Second, we remember that Lecter looks only for fun. Never forget fun. It's his nourishment. He has to want Buffalo Bill caught while Catherine Martin's still alive. All the fun and benefits have to lie in that direction. We've got nothing to threaten him with. He's already lost his books and commode seat. Only boredom threatens him. So Dr. Lecter has to think we're coming to him strictly for theory and insight, Starling said. Correct. So there's no mention of the insect in Klaus's throat. No connection between Klaus and Buffalo Bill. No. You came back to him because you were so impressed that he could predict Buffalo Bill would start scalping. And I'm doing this late at night? That's the only time I'd give you. I should tell you the business about the bug in West Virginia will be in the morning papers. The coroner's office spilled it, so that's no secret anymore. It's an inside detail that Lecter can get from you, and it doesn't matter, really, as long as he doesn't know we found one in Klaus, too. What have we got to trade him? I'm working on that. Crawford turned and left the building. From the shower in a big bathroom with sleek Italian fixtures and an elaborate vanity loaded with cosmetics, an unearthly voice hummed in a key too high. The voice belonged to Jame Gum, white male, 34, 6 feet 1 inch, 205 pounds, brown and blue, no distinguishing marks. After his first rinse, Gum applied friction de bain, rubbing it over his chest and buttocks with his hands, and using a dish mop on the parts he did not like to touch. His legs and feet were a little stubbly, but he decided they would do without further shaving. He toweled himself pink and applied a good skin emollient. Gum used the dish mop to tuck his penis and testicles back between his legs. He whipped the shower curtain aside and stood before the full-length mirror, striking a hip-shot pose, despite the grinding it caused in his private parts. The hormones he'd taken couldn't do anything for his naturally deep voice, but they had thinned the hair and a little across his slightly budding breasts. A lot of electrolysis had removed Gum's beard and shaped his hairline into a widow's peak, but he did not look like a woman. He looked like a man inclined to fight with his nails as well as his fists and feet. A dog scratched on the bathroom door at the sound of his singing. Gum put on his robe and let the little poodle in. He picked her up, kissed the plump back, and carried her into the bedroom. Yes, are you famished, precious? I am too. With his free hand, he picked up a mini-14 carbon from the floor beside the bed and laid it across the pillows. Now then, we'll have our supper. Downstairs in his kitchen, he served himself two hungry man TV dinners and a lean cuisine for the poodle. After finishing with dinner, James Gum started to turn out the kitchen light, but paused, his lips in a judicious pout, as he considered the litter of supper. A switch at the head of the stairs turned on the lights in the basement. James Gum carried the TV trays downstairs. The little dog followed close beside him through the rambling, multi-leveled basement. In a room directly beneath the kitchen was a well, long dry. Its reinforced stone rim rose two feet above the sandy floor. The heavy wooden safety cover was still in place. There was a trap in the lid big enough to lower a bucket through. The trap was open, and James Gum scraped the bits and pieces from dinner into the absolute blackness of the well. The little dog sat up and begged. No, no, all gone. You're too fat as it is. He climbed the basement stairs, whispering, Fatty bread, fatty bread, to his little dog. He gave no sign if he heard the cry, still fairly strong and sane, that echoed up from the black hole. Please! Dr. Hannibal Lecter wore the white asylum pajamas in his white cell. The only colors in the cell were his hair, eyes, and red mouth, contained in a face so long out of the sun, it bleached into the surrounding whiteness. It was after ten as Clarice Starling walked down the dim corridor toward his cell. Dr. Lecter sat at his table sketching on butcher paper, using his hand for a model. As she came closer to the bars, he looked up. Good evening, Dr. Lecter. Clarice, 
You're up late for a school night. This is night school, she said, wishing her voice were stronger. Yesterday I was in West Virginia. They found a body over there. She was scalped, just as you said she would be. You viewed the remains? Yes. Had you seen his earlier efforts? Only pictures. How did you feel? Apprehensive. Then I was busy. And after? Shaken. Could you function all right? Dr. Lecter rubbed his charcoal on the edge of the paper to refine the point. Very well, I functioned very well. You had told Jack Crawford what I said before they found her? Yes, he pretty much poo-pooed it. And after he saw the body in West Virginia? He talked to his main authority from the University of Allen Bloom. That's right. Dr. Bloom said Buffalo Bill was fulfilling a persona that newspapers created. Would you say Dr. Bloom is right? Dr. Lecter, we have some extraordinary circumstances here and some unusual opportunities. For whom? For you, if we save this woman. Senator Martin is very powerful and determined to save her daughter. Let's have it. I think you have extraordinary insight. Senator Martin has indicated that if you help us get Catherine Baker Martin back alive and unharmed, she'll help you get transferred to a federal institution, with a view if possible. I don't believe that, Clarice. You should. Oh, I believe you. But wouldn't you say that you're an odd choice of messengers? I was your choice, Dr. Lecter. You chose to speak to me. Would you prefer someone else now? Or maybe you don't think you could help? That is both impudent and untrue, Clarice. I don't believe Jack Crawford would allow any compensation to ever reach me. Possibly I'll tell you one thing you can tell the Senator, but I operate strictly COD. Maybe I'll trade for a piece of information about you. Yes or no? Let's hear the question. Yes or no? Catherine's waiting. Let's hear the question. What's your worst memory of childhood? Starling took a deep breath. Quicker than that. I'm not interested in your worst invention. The death of my father. Tell me. He was a town marshal. One night he surprised two burglars, addicts, coming out of a drugstore. As he was getting out of his pickup, they shot him. Was he killed outright? He lasted a month. Tell me a detail you remember from the hospital. Starling closed her eyes. A neighbor came, an older woman, and she recited the end of Thanatopsis to him. That's it. We've traded. Yes. We have. You've been very frank, Clarice. I always know. Quid pro quo. In life, was the girl in West Virginia very attractive physically? She was well-groomed. Don't waste my time with loyalty. She was heavy. Large. Yes. Shot in the chest. Yes. Flat-chested, I expect. For her size, yes. But big through the hips. Roomy. She was, yes. What else? She had an insect deliberately inserted in her throat. That information hasn't been made public. Was it a butterfly? Her breath stopped for a moment. It was a moth. Please tell me how you anticipated that. Clarice, I'm going to tell you what Buffalo Bill wants Catherine Baker Martin for, and then it's good night.
This is my last word under the current terms. You can tell the senator what he wants with Catherine, and she can come up with a more interesting offer for me. Or she can wait until Catherine bobs to the surface and sees that I was right. What does he want her for, Dr. Lecter? He wants a vest with tits. Catherine Baker Martin lay 17 feet below the cellar floor. She knew she wasn't dreaming. In the absolute dark, she could hear the tiny clicks her eyes made when she blinked. She was better now than when she first regained consciousness. Much of the awful vertigo was gone, and she knew there was enough air. She wore a clean, quilted jumpsuit that smelled of fabric softener. The floor was clean, too, except for the chicken bones and bits of vegetable her captor had raked into the hole. The only other objects were the futon and a plastic sanitation bucket with thin kitchen string tied to the handle. Sounds came clearly to her from overhead. The oubliette that held her was in the part of the basement directly beneath the kitchen. Footsteps now across the kitchen floor and running water. The scratching of dog claws on linoleum. Nothing then until a weak disk of yellow light threw the open trap above as the basement lights came on. Then blazing light in the pit. This time she sat up into the light, the futon across her legs, determined to look around, trying to peer through her fingers as her eyes adjusted, her shadow swaying around her as a flood lamp lowered into the pit, swung on its cord high above. She flinched as her toilet bucket moved, lifted, twisting slowly as it rose toward the light. Another bucket came down with hot, soapy water. Wash yourself. All over. There was a washcloth in the bucket, and floating in the water was a plastic bottle of an expensive imported skin emollient. She did it, goosebumps on her arms and thighs, nipples sore and shriveled in the cool air, squatting beside the bucket and as close to the wall as possible. Now pick up your litter and wash the floor. She did that too, gathering the dinner debris and putting them in the bucket. Something else here, near the wall a flake that had been dislodged from a crack above. It was a human fingernail, covered with glitter polish, and torn off far back in the quick. Some other woman had been here. The bucket was pulled aloft. The lights went out, sudden and total darkness. Her mind was working, and at last it worked too well. The skin emollient did it. Skin. Now she knew who had her. The knowledge fell on her like every scalding, awful thing on earth, and she was screaming, screaming up and climbing, clawing at the wall, screaming until she was coughing something warm and salty in her mouth, hands to her face, drying sticky on the backs of her hands, and she lay rigid, arching off the floor from head to heels, her hands clenched in her hair. Clarice Starling's quarter bonged down through the telephone in the shabby orderly's lounge of the Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Crawford here. Sir, I'm at a payphone outside the maximum security ward. Dr. Lecter asked me if the insect in West Virginia was a butterfly. He wouldn't elaborate. He said Buffalo Bill needs Catherine Martin because, I'm quoting, he wants a vest with tits. Dr. Lecter wants to trade, but with a more interesting offer from the senator. Did he break it off? Yes. How soon do you think he'll talk again? I think he'd like to do this over the next few days, but I'd rather hit him again now if I can have some kind of urgent offer from the senator. Urgent is right, Starling. We got an ID on the girl in West Virginia. Kimberly, Jane Emberg, 22, missing from Detroit since February 7. The medical examiner says she died not later than February 11, and possibly the day before. He only kept her alive three days, Starling said. His period's getting shorter. I don't think anybody's surprised. Crawford's voice was even. He's had Catherine Martin about 26 hours. I think if Lecter can deliver, he'd better do it in your next conversation. He's leery, Mr. Crawford. He's not sure you'd let him have anything worthwhile. What can we offer? I'm sending over a proposal. It'll be there in five minutes, unless you want to rest a little first. 
I have a room booked for you at the Hojo down the block. I'd rather do it now. Starling walked up and down the linoleum of the shabby lounge. Within minutes, an orderly handed her a sealed packet from Crawford. She read the contents quickly and pushed the button for Barney to let her in. Dr. Lecter was at his table examining his correspondence. Starling found it easier to approach the cage when he wasn't looking at her. I have a proposal for you, Starling said, opening her briefcase. Barney was coming. Excuse me, if you got a lot of papers to wrestle, there's a school desk in the hall closet. Want it? Yes, Barney, thank you. May we talk now, Dr. Lecter? The doctor held up an open palm. Dr. Lecter, the senator has a remarkable offer. If you help us find Buffalo Bill in time to save Catherine Martin unharmed, you get the following. Transfer to the Veterans Administration Hospital at Oneida Park, New York, to a cell with a view of the woods surrounding the hospital. Maximum security measures still apply. She glanced up. Dr. Lecter cocked his head slightly and touched the center of his red lips with his red tongue. If we talk about this, Clarice, I have to have something on account. Quid pro quo. I tell you things, and you tell me. Go, doctor. First, let's drop Buffalo Bill. It's a misleading term, and has nothing to do with the person you want. For convenience, we'll call him Billy. Ready? A caterpillar becomes a pupa in a chrysalis. The significance of the chrysalis is change. The imago, worm into butterfly or moth. Billy thinks he wants to change. He's making himself a girl suit out of real girls. Hence the large victims. He has to have things that fit. The number of victims suggests he may see it as a series of molds. Dr. Lecter, there's no correlation that I ever saw between transsexualism and violence. Transsexuals are usually passive types. That's true, Clarice. You're very close to the way you're going to catch him. Do you realize that? No, Dr. Lecter. Good. Then you won't mind telling me what happened to you after your father's death. Starling looked at her papers on the school desk. I don't imagine the answers in your papers, Clarice. My mother kept us together for more than two years. Doing what? Working as a motel maid in the daytime, cooking at a cafe at night. And then? I went to live with my mother's cousin and her husband on a sheep and horse ranch in Montana. Just you? I was the oldest. And what happened? It was great. I had my own room and they let me have a horse to ride. She couldn't see very well. There was something wrong with all the horses. I discovered that they slaughtered the horses and sold them for glue and fertilizer. I ran away with my horse, got caught, and wound up going to the Lutheran home, an orphanage in Bozeman. How old were you? Nine. The town did nothing for your family after your father's death? A check for five hundred dollars. Curious there was no insurance. Clarice, you said that your father had been in his pickup truck. Yes. He didn't have a patrol car? No. It happened at night? Yes. Didn't he have a pistol? No. Clarice, he was working at night in a pickup truck, unarmed. Tell me, did he wear a time clock on his belt by any chance? One of those things where they have keys screwed to posts all over town, and you have to drive to them and stick them in your clock, so the town fathers know you weren't asleep? Tell me if he wore one, Clarice. Yes. He was a night watchman, wasn't he, Clarice? He wasn't a marshal at all. I'll know if you lie. The job description said night marshal. What happened to it? What happened to what? The time clock. What happened to it after your father was shot? I don't remember. If you do remember, will you tell me? Yes, wait. 
The mayor came to the hospital and asked my mother for the clock and the badge. She hadn't known she knew that. She recalled the mayor in his leisure suit, the cocksucker. Quid pro quo, Dr. Lecter. Did you think for a second you'd made that up? No. If you'd made it up, it wouldn't sting. We were talking about transsexuals. There are three major centers for transsexual surgery. Johns Hopkins, the University of Minnesota, and Columbus Medical Center. I wouldn't be surprised if he's applied for sex reassignment at one or all of them and been denied. You should try to obtain a list of people rejected from these institutions. Check first for those applicants rejected for having a criminal record, and among those look hard at the burglars. Also seek out the people who tried to conceal their criminal records and those that suffered severe childhood disturbances associated with violence possibly internment in childhood. Then go to the standard tests. You're looking for a male who will test differently from the way a true transsexual would test. You're looking for a white male, probably under 35, and sizable. He's not a transsexual, Clarice. He just thinks he is. And he's puzzled and angry because they won't help him. That's all I want to say, I think, until I've read the case file. You will leave it with me. Yes. Then you'd better run with what you have, Clarice, and we'll see how you do. Come back when you've made some progress. And Clarice. Yes? Next time, you'll tell me two things. What else happened to you in Montana is one. The other thing I wonder is, how do you manage your rage? Dr. Hannibal Lecter stood stiffly upright at the end of the corridor, his face a foot from the wall. Heavy canvas webbing bound him tightly to a tall mover's hand truck, as though he were a grandfather clock. Beneath the webbing he wore a straitjacket and leg restraints. A hockey mask over his face precluded biting. Behind him an orderly mopped Lecter's cell. Barney supervised the thrice-weekly cleaning and searched for contraband at the same time. Dr. Lecter amused himself by recalling the voice of the late Benjamin Raspail. Dr. Lecter was deliberating on how he would give Jame gum to Clarice Starling, and it was useful to remember Raspail. Here was the flutist on the last day of his life, lying on Lecter's therapy couch, telling him about the man now referred to as Buffalo Bill. Jame was sitting on his bed with his head in his hands in the most atrocious room imaginable in this San Francisco flophouse, and he'd been fired from the curio store. His boss set dead butterflies in lucite and made the tackiest ornaments imaginable, and he had the gall to call them objet. Anyway, I told him I simply couldn't put up with his behavior, and Klaus had just come into my life, of course. You know, you always felt the room was a little emptier when Jame came in. I mean, he killed his grandparents when he was 12. You'd think a person that volatile would have some presence, wouldn't you? And here he was, no job. He'd done the bad thing again to some luckless bag person. I had left him. He'd gone by the post office and picked up his former employer's mail, hoping there was something he could sell. And there was this package from Malaysia, or somewhere over there. He eagerly opened it up, and it was a suitcase full of dead butterflies, just in there loose. So he sat on the bed with his head in his hands, crying. But he was distracted by a butterfly, miraculously alive, noisily struggling out of its cocoon. He watched it pump up its wings, and then he opened the window, letting it fly away. Jame felt so light, he said, that he knew what he was going to do. When I came home from rehearsal to our little beach house, Jame was there, but Klaus wasn't. Jame said that he was swimming, but I knew that was a lie. Klaus never swam, the Pacific's much too crashy-bangy for him, and when I opened the refrigerator, well, you know what I found. Klaus's head looking out from behind the orange juice. Jame had made himself an apron, too, you know, from Klaus, and he put it on and asked me how I liked him now. I know you must be appalled that I'd ever have anything else to do with Jame. He was even more unstable when you met him. I think he was just astounded that you weren't afraid of him. Dr. Lecter could remember every word and much more, too. Pleasant thoughts to pass the time while they cleaned his cell. But to get Jame gum in time, 
Clarice Starling would need more specifics. Dr. Lecter felt sure that when he read the details of the crimes, hints would suggest themselves, possibly having to do with Gum's job training in the juvenile correction facility after he killed his grandparents with whom he'd been living. He'd give her Jane Gum tomorrow, and make it clear enough so that even Jack Crawford couldn't miss it. Tomorrow should see it done. There was a slight bump as the hand truck carrying Dr. Lecter rolled over the threshold of the cage, and here was Dr. Chilton sitting on the cot, looking through Dr. Lecter's private correspondence. Chilton went to the school desk that Clarice Starling had used, and bending stiffly, he removed a small listening device from beneath the seat. He waggled it in front of the eye holes in Dr. Lecter's mask and resumed his seat on the cot. I thought she might be looking for a civil rights violation in Mig's death. So I listened. Dr. Lecter said nothing. Do you get it yet? They know, Hannibal. They know that you know exactly who Buffalo Bill is. They think you probably treated him. When I heard Miss Starling ask about Buffalo Bill, I was puzzled, so I called a friend at Homicide. They found an insect in Klaus's throat, Hannibal. I also called Senator Ruth Martin, and she never heard of you or Clarice Starling. There never was a deal for you with Senator Martin. But there is now. Or there could be. I've been on the phone for hours on your behalf and for the sake of the Martin girl. I'm going to tell you the first condition. You speak only through me. I alone publish a professional account of this, my successful interview with you. Dr. Lecter smiled to himself. Now this is the deal. If you identify Buffalo Bill and the girl is found in time, Senator Martin will have you installed in Brushy Mountain State Prison in Tennessee, out of the reach of the Maryland authorities and away from Jack Crawford. You'll be in a maximum security cell with a view of the woods. You get books. Name him and you can go at once. The Tennessee State Police will take custody of you at the airport. The governor has agreed. At last, Dr. Chilton has said something interesting, and he doesn't even know what it is. Dr. Lecter pursed his red lips behind the mask. The custody of police. Police are not as wise as Barney. Police are accustomed to handling criminals. They're inclined to use leg irons and handcuffs. Handcuffs and leg irons open with a handcuff key, like my own key. His first name is Billy. I'll tell the rest to the senator in Tennessee. Dr. Danielson was head of the gender identity clinic at Johns Hopkins, and he had agreed to meet Crawford at first light, long before morning rounds. Doctor, we need your help, and we have to do this fast. If the girl's not dead already, Buffalo Bill will kill her soon, possibly tonight or tomorrow, and then he'll pick the next one. I'm not having a witch hunt here. We never violated a patient's confidence, and we never will. I'm sorry, Mr. Crawford. Then I haven't made myself clear, Doctor. My fault. It's early. The whole idea is, the man we want is not your patient. It would be someone you refused because you recognized that he was not a transsexual. We're not flying blind here. I'll show you some specific ways he'd deviate from typical transsexual patterns in your personality inventories. Here's a short list of things your staff could look for among your rejects. Dr. Danielson rubbed the side of his nose with his finger as he read. He handed the paper back. That's original, Mr. Crawford. In fact, it's extremely bizarre. And that's a word I don't use very often. May I ask who provided you with that piece of conjecture? I don't think you'd like to know that, Dr. Danielson, Crawford said to himself. The behavioral science staff, he said aloud, in consultation with Dr. Alan Bloom at the University of Chicago. Alan Bloom endorsed that? And we don't just depend on the tests. There's another way Buffalo Bill's likely to stand out in your records. He probably tried to conceal a record of criminal violence or falsified other background material. Show me the ones you turned away, doctor. Danielson was shaking his head the whole time. I know Alan Bloom, and I'd rather discuss this on a professional level. 
Tell him I'll be in touch with him this morning. I'll tell you what I've decided before noon. Good morning to you, sir. Crawford's beeper sounded as he got off the hospital elevator. She's dead, and they found her, Crawford thought, as he grabbed the lobby phone. It was the director calling. The news wasn't as bad as it could have been, but it was bad enough. Chilton had butted into the case, and now Senator Martin was stepping in. The Attorney General of the State of Maryland, on instructions from the governor, had authorized the extradition to Tennessee of Dr. Hannibal Lecter. Clarice Starling sat on the motel bed, staring at the telephone for quite some time after Crawford hung up. She was in a rage, and Jack Crawford was knocking on the door. What do you say, Starling? I say, God damn it, Mr. Crawford. What if Chilton's wasted her? What if Catherine dies because of him? I really want to get in his face. Let me stay with this, Mr. Crawford. Don't send me back to school. Two things. If I keep you, it won't be to get in Chilton's face. That comes later. Second, if I keep you much longer, you'll be recycled cost you some months. The Academy cuts nobody any slack. I can guarantee you get back in, but that's all. This is the most difficult time, Starling. Use this time, and it'll temper you. Now's the hardest test, not letting rage and frustration keep you from thinking. Chilton's a goddamn fool, and he may have cost Catherine Martin her life, but maybe not. We're her chance. I want you to keep your eyes on the prize, Starling. Catherine Martin's life and Buffalo Bill's hide on the barn door. That's all that matters. You worked for some information, paid for it, got it. Now we'll use it. If you can do that, I need you. I want you in Tennessee. We can hope Lecter tells the senator something useful. But if not, if he gets tired of tormenting and toying with her, maybe he'll talk to you. Whistle up Jeff in the van. You're on a plane to Memphis in 40 minutes. Jack Crawford was skilled at managing her. She wondered if men actually regarded that kind of manipulation as subtle. But the fact was, she felt lighter, better. Curious how things can work on you, even when you recognize them. Across the street, she saw Barney lumbering down the steps of the hospital and called to him. He turned to face her, expressionless. Barney, I want you to do a favor for me. After that school desk bug, I think you owe me one. I want you to do it now, with no questions. I'll ask you nicely. Were Dr. Lecter's drawings left in his cell? They're still there, and a couple of books. I want it all, and I'm in a hell of a hurry. He considered her for a second, turned and trotted back up the steps, lightly for such a big man. She was waiting in the van when Barney came back out with a shopping bag and handed it to her. Listen, when you get Buffalo Bill, don't bring him to me just because I got a vacancy, all right? He smiled. Barney had little baby teeth. Major Bachman of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation was calling Senator Martin. Chilton beckoned from the door. In the room was a desk for Chilton and chairs for Senator Martin, her assistant, and for Major Bachman. Dr. Hannibal Lecter sat alone in the middle of the room in a stout oak armchair, bolted to the floor. A blanket covered his straitjacket and leg restraints, concealing the fact that he was chained to the chair. The senator held up a document. Dr. Lecter, this is an affidavit which says I'll help you. Want to read it? Senator, I won't waste Catherine's time bargaining for petty privileges. Let me help you now, and I'll trust you to help me later. You can count on it, Doctor. Buffalo Bill's name is William Rubin. He goes by Billy Rubin. He was referred to me in the spring of 1975 by my patient Benjamin Raspael. He said he lived in Philadelphia, but was staying with Raspael in Baltimore. Where are your records? Major Bachman broke in. My records were destroyed by court order shortly after... What did he look like? Major Bachman said. Do you mind, Major? Senator Martin, the only... Give me an age and a physical description. Major Bachman continued to harass Dr. Lecter with questions and if Hannibal Lecter heard them, he didn't show it. Senator Martin regained his attention, having cleared the room. Dr. Lecter's eyes focused on her. Did you nurse, Catherine? Pardon me? Did I... Did you... breastfeed her? Yes. 
thirsty work, isn't it? When her pupils darkened, Dr. Lecter took a single sip of her pain and found it exquisite. That was enough pleasure for today. He went on. William Rubin is about six feet one and would be thirty-five years old now. He's strongly built, about one hundred ninety pounds when I knew him, and he's gained since then, I expect. He has brown hair and pale blue eyes. Billy Rubin told me he had a criminal record, but no details. I took a brief medical history. It was unexceptional, except for one thing. Rubin told me he once suffered from elephant ivory anthrax. That's all I remember, Senator Martin, and I expect you're anxious to go. Were the other things you told the FBI true? At least as true as what the FBI told me, Senator Martin. Thank you, Dr. Lecter. Love your suit, he said as she went out the door. Room into room, James Gum's basement rambles like the maze that thwarts us in dreams. It is now in total darkness. In the oubliette, Catherine Martin is quiet. Mr. Gum is here in the basement, but he is not in this chamber. The room beyond the stairs is black to human vision, but it is full of small sounds. Water trickles here, and small pumps hum. The air is moist and cool. Smell the greenery. Acacia. A flutter of wings against the cheek. A few clicks across the air. A low nasal sound of pleasure. A human sound. The room has none of the wavelengths of light the human eye can use, but Mr. Gum can see very well, though he sees everything in shades and intensities of green. He's wearing an excellent pair of infrared goggles, and he directs the beam of an infrared flashlight on the wire cage in front of him. He is sitting on the edge of a straight chair, wrapped, watching an insect climb a plant in the screen cage in front of him. The young Amago has just emerged from a split chrysalis in the moist earth of the cage floor. Mr. Gum feels so good and light inside. He walks quietly with his light into the oubliette room and shines his invisible light down the shaft. The material is lying on her side, curled like a shrimp. In her sleep, she clutches the corner of the futon against her face and sucks her thumb. This one is so special, so central to what he is doing, he can't stand to wait long, and he doesn't have to. Tomorrow afternoon he can do it or tomorrow night, the next day at the latest, soon. The Tennessee authorities were taking no chances with Hannibal Lecter. They were determined to hold him securely in a massive Gothic structure built of granite. A former courthouse and jail, it was now a city office building. Today it looked like a medieval stronghold surrounded by police. Using her FBI identity card and Dr. Chilton's name as authorization for visitation privileges, Clarice Starling managed to bluff her way through the web of security that surrounded Hannibal Lecter. As she approached, Starling could see that Dr. Lecter's cell was spotless white and brightly lit. A flimsy paper screen stood in front of the toilet. He was reading at a small table bolted to the floor. His back was to the door. Good morning, Clarice, he said without turning around. He finished his page, marked his place, and spun in his chair to face her. I thought you might want your drawings, the stuff from your hospital cell, just until you get your view. How thoughtful. Dr. Chilton's euphoric about you and Jack Crawford being put off the case. Or did they send you in for one last wheedle? They didn't send me. I just came. People will say we're in love. Don't you want to ask about Billy Rubin, Clarice? Dr. Lecter, without in any way impugning what you've told Senator Martin, would you advise me to go on with your idea about impugning? I love it. I wouldn't advise you at all. You tried to fool me, Clarice. Do you think I'm playing with these people? 
I think you were telling me the truth. Pity you tried to fool me, isn't it? Pity Catherine Martin won't ever see the sun again, Clarice. Pity you have to pander now, Dr. Lecter, and lick a few tears when you can. It's a pity we didn't get to finish what we were talking about. Your idea of the Amago, the structure of it, had a kind of elegance that's hard to get away from. Now it's like a ruin, half an arch standing there. Half an arch won't stand, Clarice. What's that under your jacket? A watchman's clock, just like Dad's? No, that's a speed loader. So you go around armed? Yes, I do now. Then you should let your jacket out. Do you sew at all? Yes. Did you make that costume? No. Dr. Lecter, you couldn't have talked intimately with the Billy Rubin and come out knowing so little about him. You think not. If you met him, you would know everything. But today you happen to remember just one detail. He'd had elephant ivory anthrax. Dr. Lecter, if you met him, you know about him. I think maybe you didn't meet him, and Raspail told you about him. Secondhand stuff wouldn't sell as well to Senator Martin, would it? You had more to tell me in Baltimore, Dr. Lecter. I believe that stuff was valid. Tell me the rest. I've read the case file, Clarice. Have you? Everything you need to know to find him is right there, if you're paying attention. Even Inspector Emeritus Crawford should have figured it out. Tell me how. What does he do? The man you want. He kills. Ah, that's incidental. What is the first and principal thing he does? What need does he serve by killing? Anger, social resentment, sexual frustration. No. What then? He covets. In fact, he covets being the very thing you are. How do we begin to covet? Clarice, do we seek out things to covet? No, we just... No, precisely so. We begin by coveting what we see every day. All right, then tell me how... It's your turn to tell me, Clarice. You don't have any pretty views to offer me anymore. It's strictly quid pro quo from here on out. I have to be careful doing business with you. Tell me, Clarice. Tell me the two things you owe me from before. What else happened to you in Montana? And what do you do with your anger? Dr. Lecter, when there's time, I'll... We don't reckon time the same way, Clarice. This is all the time you'll ever have. Later, listen, I'll... I'll listen now. Did your foster father fuck you, Clarice? No. Did he try? No. What made you run away with the horse? They were going to kill her. Did you know when? Not exactly. I worried about it all the time. What triggered you then? What set you off on that particular day? I don't know. I think you do. What set you off, Clarice? You started what time? Early morning. Still dark. Then something woke you. What? Did you dream? What was it? I woke up and heard the lambs screaming. I woke up in the dark and the lambs were screaming. They were slaughtering the spring lambs? Yes. You still wake up sometimes, don't you? Wake up in the iron dark with the lambs screaming? Sometimes. Do you think if you caught Buffalo Bill yourself, and if you made Catherine all right, you could make the lambs stop screaming? Do you think they'd be all right too, and you wouldn't wake up again in the dark and hear the lambs screaming, Clarice? Yes. I don't know, maybe... Thank you, Clarice. Dr. Lecter seemed oddly at peace.
Tell me his name, Dr. Lecter. Dr. Chilton, Lecter said. I believe you know one another. For an instant, Starling didn't realize Chilton was standing behind her. Then he took her elbow. Officer Pembry, if you would, Chilton said. You're not in charge here, Dr. Chilton, Starling said. The corrections officer came around Chilton. No, ma'am, but I am. Dr. Chilton called my boss and your boss both. I'm sorry, but I got orders to see you out. Goodbye, Clarice, Lecter said. Will you let me know if ever the lambs stop screaming? Yes, I'll tell you. Do you promise? Yes. Then why not finish the arch? Take your case file with you, Clarice. I won't need it any more. He held it at arm's length through the bars, his forefinger along the spine. She reached across the barrier and took it. For an instant, the tip of her forefinger touched Dr. Lecter's. The touch crackled in his eyes. Thank you, Clarice. Tennessee Department of Corrections officers Pembry and Boyle were experienced men brought especially from Brushy Mountain State Prison to be Dr. Lecter's warders. They had arrived in Memphis ahead of Lecter and examined the cell minutely. When Dr. Lecter was brought to the old courthouse, they examined him as well. He was subjected to an internal body search by a male nurse while he was still in restraints. His clothing was searched thoroughly and a metal detector run over the seams. Boyle and Pembry came to an understanding with him, speaking in low, civil tones close to his ears as he was examined. Dr. Lecter, we can get along just fine. We'll treat you just as good as you treat us. Dr. Lecter crinkled his eyes at them in a friendly fashion. If he had been inclined to reply, he would have been prevented by the wooden peg between his molars as the nurse shined a flashlight in his mouth and ran a gloved finger into his cheeks. It strikes me he's pretty much of a broke dick, Boyle confided to Pembry after they had Dr. Lecter secure in his cell. He won't be no trouble if he don't flip out. The cell, while secure and strong, lacked a rolling food carrier. At lunchtime in the unpleasant atmosphere that followed Starling's visit, Dr. Chilton inconvenienced everyone, making Boyle and Pembry go through the long process of securing the compliant Dr. Lecter in the straitjacket and leg restraints before they opened the door to carry in his tray. Dr. Chilton was absent at supper, and with Dr. Lecter's bemused cooperation, Boyle and Pembry used their own method to take in his tray. It worked very well. Dr. Lecter, you're not going to be needing your dinner jacket tonight, Pembry said. I'll ask you to sit on the floor and scoot backwards till you can just stick your hands out through the bar's arms extended backward. Officer Pembry, would you mind if I use the toilet first? I'm afraid my trip's gotten my digestion a little out of sorts. All right, we can wait a little. Dr. Lecter went behind the screen and sat on the lid of the toilet, his only private place. He ran his tongue around his mouth and extracted a small metal tube that he had concealed between his cheek and gum. In Baltimore, the tube had been the ink vial of a ballpoint pen. He tapped the tube on his thumbnail until a slender wire made from a paper clip slipped out. Now he had his handcuff key. He hid the key between the fingers of his right hand, knowing Pembry would stare at his six-fingered left hand when it was behind his back. He came around the screen. He sat on the floor of the cell and stretched his arms behind him, his hands and wrists through the bars. Pembry handcuffed Dr. Lecter tightly outside the bars, with a bar between his arms and a low crossbar above them. Dr. Lecter found the keyhole in his left handcuff, inserted his key, and turned it. He felt the cuff spring loose on his wrist. He passed the key to his other hand, found the cuff keyhole, and turned it. Boyle bent to place the tray on the floor. Fast as a snapping turtle, the handcuff closed on Boyle's wrist, and as he turned his rolling eyes to Lecter, the other cuff locked around the fixed leg of the table. 
Dr. Lecter's legs under him now, driving him into the door, Pembry trying to come from behind it, and Lecter's shoulder driving the iron door into him, Pembry going for the mace in his belt, his arm mashed to his body by the door. Lecter grabbed the long end of Pembry's riot baton and lifted. With the leverage twisting Pembry's belt tightly around him, he hit Pembry in the throat with his elbow and sunk his teeth in Pembry's face. Pembry trying to claw at Lecter, his nose and upper lip caught between the tearing teeth. Lecter shook his head like a rat-killing dog and pulled the riot baton from Pembry's belt. In the cell, Boyle bellowing now, sitting on the floor, digging desperately in his pocket for his handcuff key, fumbling, dropping it, finding it again. Lecter drove the end of the baton into Pembry's stomach and throat, and he went to his knees. Boyle, still bellowing, got the key in a lock of the handcuffs. Lecter coming at him now. Lecter shut Boyle up with a shot of the mace, and as he wheezed, cracked his upstretched arm with two blows of the baton. Boyle tried to get under the table, but blinded by the mace, he crawled the wrong way, and it was easy, with five judicious blows to beat him to death. Pembry had managed to sit up, and he was crying. Dr. Lecter looked down at him with his red smile. I'm ready if you are, Officer Pembry. The baton, whistling in a flat arc, caught Pembry pock on the back of the head, and he shivered out straight like a clubbed fish. Dr. Lecter's pulse was elevated to more than 100 by the exercise, but quickly slowed to normal. He turned out Pembry's pockets, got the desk key, and opened all its drawers. In the bottom drawer were Boyle's and Pembry's duty weapons, a pair of 38 special revolvers. Even better, he found a pocket knife. Sergeant C.L. Tate of the Tennessee SWAT team had seen many things, but he thought that what lay at his feet was the worst thing he had ever seen happen to an officer. The meat above the uniform collar no longer resembled a face. The front and top of the head were a slick of blood peaked with torn flesh, and a single eye was stuck beside the nostrils, the sockets full of blood. Patrolman Jacobs passed Tate, slipping on the bloody floor as he went into the cell. He bent over Boyle, still handcuffed to the table leg. Boyle, partly eviscerated, his face hacked to pieces, seemed to have exploded blood in the cell, the walls covered with gouts and splashes. Jacobs put his fingers on the neck. This one's dead, Sarge. How's Pembry? Tate knelt, and as he reached for the neck to feel, the awful thing on the floor groaned and blew a bloody bubble. Pembry's alive. Come here, Mary. Tate called to a young patrolman. Get down here with Pembry and take a hold of him where you can feel your hands on him. Talk to him. What's his name, Sarge? Murray was green. It's Pembry, now talk to him, goddammit. Tate on the radio. Two officers down. Boyle's dead and Pembry's hurt bad. Lecter's missing and armed. He took the guns. Confirm ambulances en route. Orders on the radio now. Tate, I want you to clear the officers and the tower and seal it off. We'll get him alive if he wants to come, but we take no special risk to preserve his life. Understand me? I got it, Lieutenant. The ambulances were there amazingly fast, but it did not seem fast enough to Tate, listening to the pitiful thing at his feet. Young Murray was trying to hold the groaning, jerking body as the ambulance crew lifted Pembry onto a stretcher. Tate and Jacobs carefully carried out their orders to help clear the offices and seal off the building as the sirens wailed outside. They were in the elevator riding down to the lobby when a drop of blood fell on Tate's shoulder. Another hit his shoe. He looked at the ceiling of the elevator car, touched Jacobs, and motioned for silence. Blood was dripping from the crack around the service hatch in the top of the car. It seemed a long descent to the lobby. Tate and Jacobs stepped off backwards, guns pointed at the ceiling of the elevator. They were set up in moments. Two SWAT officers in black body armor and headsets climbed the stairs to the third floor landing. In the lobby with Tate were two more officers, their assault rifles pointed at the elevator ceiling. Tate watched his men go into the elevator car. A rifleman aimed his weapon at the top of the elevator. A second officer, armed with a large automatic pistol with a flashlight clamped beneath, climbed on a ladder. A mirror and the pistol light went up through the hatch. 
then the officer's head and shoulders. He handed down a thirty-eight revolver. He's dead, the officer called down. Tate wondered if the death of Dr. Lecter meant Catherine Martin would die too. All the information lost when the lights went out in that monster mind. The officers were pulling him down now, the body coming upside down through the elevator hatch, eased down into many arms, an odd deposition in a lighted box. The lobby was filling up, policemen crowding in to see. A corrections officer pushed forward, looked at the body's outflung, tattooed arms. That's Pembry. In the back of the howling ambulance, the young attendant braced himself against the sway and turned to his radio to report to his emergency room supervisor, talking loud above the siren. Behind him on the stretcher, the bald and bloody fists grip the surgical bandage and wipe out the eyes. The attendant turned around when he heard the hiss of the airway closing down and saw the bloody face coming at his own. On the second knock, Crawford opened the door to his house to Clarice Starling. Motioning her to follow, he led her to his study, grunting into a cordless telephone as he went. Agent Copley in Memphis says they haven't found the ambulance yet, he said as he turned off the phone and stuffed it into his pocket. Police barracks are turning out all over the South. I don't know any details, Mr. Crawford. The radio just had the bulletin that Dr. Lecter killed two policemen and escaped. Two corrections officers. Crawford punched up the crawling text on his computer screen. Names were Boyle and Pembry. They loaded Lecter into an ambulance by mistake. They thought he was Pembry, badly injured. Did he have on Pembry's uniform? They were about the same size. He put on Pembry's uniform and part of Pembry's face, and about a pound off Boyle, too. He wrapped Pembry's body in the waterproof mattress cover and the sheets from his cell to keep it from dripping and stuffed it on top of the elevator. He put on the uniform got himself fixed up, laid on the floor, and waited for the stampede. The ambulance crew came in fast. They think Lecter called the ambulances himself so he wouldn't have to lie around too long, and did what they're trained to do. They never made it to the hospital. Dr. Lecter likes his fun. Starling had never heard the bitter snarl in Crawford's voice before. It frightened her. The phone in Crawford's pocket buzzed. He listened for a few moments, said okay, and hung up. They found the ambulance in the underground garage at the Memphis airport. Crew was in the back. Dead. Both of them. Crawford took off his glasses, rummaged for his handkerchief to polish them. Starling? Yes, Mr. Crawford. Go back to school. If you spend any more time away, you'll definitely be recycled. Do you know what happens when you're recycled? Sure, you're sent back to the regional office that recruited you. You get to file reports and make coffee until you get another spot in a class. I can promise you a place in a later class, but I can't keep them from recycling you if you miss the time. So I go back to school and stop working on this, or... Your job was lector. You did it. I'm not asking you to take a recycle. It could cost you maybe half a year, maybe more. Go back to school. If you didn't want me to chase Buffalo Bill, you shouldn't have taken me to that funeral home, Mr. Crawford. On the steps, she noticed a lighted window where a nurse kept watch. She looked back at Crawford. I'm thinking about you and Bella, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Starling. Crawford stood alone in the center of his study with his hands jammed deep in his pockets. The message on the screen of the computer terminal reflected on Crawford's lenses. The message was, Memphis police recovered two items during search of Lecter's cell. One, improvised handcuff key. Request Baltimore to check hospital cell for traces of manufacture. Two, sheet of notepaper floating in toilet left by fugitive. Graphic of writing follows. The graphic spelled out Chilton's name with various numbers inserted between the letters and a loop indicating the transposition of the last two letters. As Crawford puzzled over this, his telephone rang. It was Jerry Burroughs at the National Crime Information Center. See your screen, Jack? The drawing Lecter left in the John. It's biochemistry. It's the formula for a pigment in human bile called Billy Rubin. Lab advises it's a chief coloring agent in shit. Balls. 
You were right about Lecter, Jack. He was just jerking him around. Too bad for Senator Martin. Lab says Billy Rubin's just about the color of Chilton's hair. Institutional humor, they call it. From the windows in his suite at the elegant Marcus Hotel, Dr. Hannibal Lecter could see across the street to the St. Louis City Hospital. The Myron and Sadie Fleischer Pavilion housed one of the world's foremost centers for craniofacial surgery. Dr. Lecter's visage was too well known for him to be able to take advantage of the plastic surgeons here, but it was one place in the world where he could walk around with a bandage on his face without exciting interest. The only real rush of the evening had been in the underground garage at Memphis International Airport. Cleaning up in the back of the parked ambulance was not at all convenient. Once he was in the attendant's whites, it was just a matter of catching a lone traveler in a deserted aisle of long-term parking. The man obligingly leaned into the trunk of his car for his luggage and never saw Dr. Lecter come up behind him. He savored his window view and was pleasantly fatigued by the five-hour drive from Memphis. Tomorrow, he would shop for things he needed, hair bleach, barbering supplies, a sun lamp, and there were other prescription items that he would obtain to make some immediate changes in his appearance. When it was convenient, he would move on. There was no reason to hurry. Catherine Baker Martin down in the hateful dark. Dark swarmed behind her eyelids, and in jerky seconds of sleep and waking, she heard a familiar busy sound, a sewing machine. Sewing is so wrong down here. Sewing belongs to the light. Catherine did not know how long she had been captive. She knew that she was washed twice. The last time she had stood up in the lights, wanting him to see her body, not sure if he was looking down from behind the blinding light. Catherine Baker Martin, naked, was a showstopper, a girl and a half in all directions, and she knew it. She wanted him to see. She wanted out of the pit. Close enough to fuck is close enough to fight. She said it silently to herself over and over as she washed. She was getting very little to eat, and she knew she'd better do it while she had her strength. She knew she would fight him. She knew she could fight. Would it be better to fuck him first, fuck him as many times as he could do it, and wear him out? She knew if she could ever get her legs around his neck, she could send him home to Jesus in about a second and a half. Can I stand to do that? You're damn right I can. Balls and eyes, balls and eyes, balls and eyes. But there had been no reply to her offers as she finished washing and put on the fresh jumpsuit. Catherine Baker Martin's tears spread hot on her cheeks and fell, plucking at the front of her jumpsuit, soaking through, warm on her breasts, and she believed that she would surely die. Jame Gum was propped against the headboard of his bed, and very comfortable. The little dog curled up warm on his tummy. There was much to do to get ready for tomorrow. Oh, precious, come here to Mommy. Mommy's gonna be so beautiful. He had learned to do everything well ahead of time, so as he went downstairs, he admonished himself. You have to be orderly. You have to be precise. You have to be expeditious because the problems are formidable. The workroom opened into a basement corridor leading to a disused bath where Mr. Gum stored his hoisting tackle and his timepiece and on to the studio in the vast black warren beyond. He opened his studio door to brilliant light, floodlights fastened to ceiling beams, mannequins doubled in number by two mirrored walls posed on a raised floor of pickled oak, Mr. Gum had progressed in tailoring far beyond what the California Department of Corrections had taught him in youth, but this was a true challenge. Even working delicate cabretta leather does not prepare you for really fine work. He had had two muslin-fitting garments, like waistcoats, one his exact size, now resting on a tailor's form cast from his own torso, and one he made from measurements he took while Catherine Baker Martin was still unconscious. When he put the smaller one on his tailor's form, the problems were apparent. She was a big girl and wonderfully proportioned, but she wasn't as big as Mr. Gum and not nearly so broad across the back. Mr. Gum slipped the muslin off the form and started to work. Patiently, he picked out the stitches and laid out the pieces, a perfect pattern to cut by. 
tomorrow. Precious will do it first thing tomorrow. Mommy's going to be so beautiful. Starling slept hard for five hours and woke in the pit of the night, driven awake by fear of the dream. She bit the corner of the sheet and pressed her palms over her ears, waiting to find out if she were truly awake and away from it. Silence and no lambs screaming. In a moment, her mind would race. She knew it. Fuck this, Starling said aloud and put her feet on the floor. You're over there corrupting a moron, aren't you, Starling? Ardelia Mapp said. Sorry, Ardelia, I didn't. You gotta be a lot more specific with them than that, Starling. You can't just say what you said. Corrupting morons is just like journalism. You gotta tell them what, when, where, and how. I think why gets self-explanatory as you go along. Have you got any laundry? I thought I heard you say, did I have any laundry? Yep, I think I'll run a load. What you got? Just those sweats on the back of the door. Okay, shut your eyes. I'm gonna turn on the light for just a second. It was not the Fourth Amendment notes for her upcoming exam that she piled on top of the clothes basket and lugged down the hall to the laundry room. She took the Buffalo Bill case file, a four-inch thick pile of hell and pain with ink the color of blood. In the warm laundry room, with the washing machine's comforting chug, she laid out the papers of the file. The map was on top with some handwriting on it. Dr. Lecter's elegant script ran across the Great Lakes, and it said, Clarice, does this random scattering of sights seem overdone to you? Doesn't it seem desperately random, random past all possible convenience? Does it suggest to you the elaborations of a bad liar? Ta, Hannibal Lecter. Starling called the agency hotline from the payphone in the hall and read the message to Burroughs. She wondered when the man slept. I have to tell you, Starling, the market and lector information is way down. You'll punch this up for Mr. Crawford, though, Starling said. Sure, I'll put it on his screen, but we're not calling him right now. You shouldn't either. Bella died a little while ago. Thank you for telling me, Mr. Burroughs. Good night. Back in the laundry room with the dryer spinning, Starling walked her fingers over the map. Here an abduction, there the dump. Here the second abduction, there the dump, here the third, and... But are these dates backward, or... No, the second body was discovered first. That fact was recorded, unremarked, in smudged ink beside the location on the map. The body of the second woman abducted was found first, floating in the Wabash River in downtown Lafayette, just below Interstate 65. The first young woman, Frederica Bemmel, was taken from Belvedere, Ohio, near Columbus, and found much later in the Blackwater River in Missouri. The body of the first victim was sunk in water in a remote area. The second was dumped in a river upstream from a city where quick discovery was certain. Why? The one he started with was well hidden. The second one, not. Why? Desperately random, Dr. Lecter had said. What does he do, Clarice? What is the first and principal thing he does? What need does he serve by killing? He covets. How do we begin to covet? We begin by coveting what we see every day. Dr. Lecter had said there was enough in the file to locate the killer. Starling called Burroughs again. He was sounding a little tired, but he listened. So what are you saying, Starling? Maybe he lives in Belvedere, Ohio, where the first victim lived. Maybe he saw her every day. And he killed her sort of spontaneously. Maybe he just meant to give her a seven-up and talk about the choir. So he did a good job of hiding the body, and then he grabbed another one far from home. He didn't hide that one very well, so it would be found first, and the attention would be directed away from him. You know how much attention a missing person report gets. It gets zip until the body's found. Would you put it up for Mr. Crawford about the first town? Sure. Hell, I'll put it on the hotline for everybody. Starling got the clothes out of the dryer. She hugged the warm bundle close to her chest, triggering a sense memory. Her mother, with an armload of sheets. And then the thought. Today is the last day of Catherine's life. When Clarice Starling decided what she would do, a few tears came. 
she hid her face in the warm laundry. Crawford came out of the funeral home and saw Clarice Starling waiting under the awning. Forgive me, Starling said. I wouldn't come now if there were any other time. Send me. Send you where? For what? To get a feel for his victims. I can walk in a woman's room and know three times as much about her as any man could know, and you know that's a fact. All we've got left is to find out how he hunts. Send me. You ready to accept a recycle? Yes. Who would you start with? The first one, Frederica Bemmel, Belvedere, Ohio. Not Kimberly Emberg, the one you saw in Potter? He didn't start with her. Go, Starling. Just to the first one. Post the hotline. Call me. On the morning of the fourth day, Mr. Gum was ready to harvest the hide. It was hard to behave in a responsible manner. He wanted to fly about the room like Danny Kay. He laughed and blew a moth away from his face with a gentle puff of air. Oh, was there a nice chrysalis buried in the humus in the cage? He poked with his finger. Yes, there was. The pistol. Now. The problem of killing this one had perplexed Mr. Gum for days. Hanging her was out because he didn't want the pectoral modeling, and besides, he couldn't risk the knot tearing her behind the ear. He had in the past hunted young women through the blacked-out basement, using his infrared goggles and light, and it was wonderful to do. Watching them feel their way around, seeing them try to scrunch into corners, he liked to hunt them with the pistol. That was childish and a waste. They were damaged and useless afterwards, so he had quit doing it altogether. In his current project, he had offered showers upstairs to the first three before he booted them down the staircase with a noose around their necks. No problem. But the fourth had been a disaster. He'd had to use the pistol in the bathroom, and it had taken an hour to clean up. He thought about the girl, wet, goosebumps on her, shivering when he cocked the pistol. Mr. Gum wanted very much to offer this one a shampoo because he wanted to watch it comb out the hair. He could learn much for his own grooming about how the hair lay on the head, but this one was tall and probably strong. This one was too rare to risk having to waste the whole thing with gunshot wounds. No, he'd get his hoisting tackle from the bathroom, offer her a bath, and when she had put herself securely in the hoisting sling, he'd bring her halfway up the shaft of the oubliette and shoot her several times, low in the spine. When she lost consciousness, he could do the rest with chloroform. That's it. He'd go upstairs now and get out of his clothes. He'd wake up precious and then go to work, naked in the warm basement, naked as the day he was born. As he gazed out the windows of his office at FBI headquarters, Crawford's intra-office phone buzzed. Mr. Crawford, a Dr. Danielson from Johns Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic, is... Right. He punched the phone button. Jack Crawford, doctor, any news for me? If anything comes of it, I want you to make it clear to the public he's not a transsexual. He had nothing to do with this institution. Who, Dr. Danielson? He applied to the program three years ago as John Grant of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Description? Caucasian male. He was 31, 6 feet 1, 190 pounds. He came to be tested and did very well, but the psychological testing and the interviews were another story. Spot on with what you gave me. He let me think Alan Bloom authored that little theory, but it was Hannibal Lecter, wasn't it? Go on with Grant, Doctor. The board would have turned him down anyway, but by the time we met to discuss it, the question was moot because the background checks got him. Got him? How? We routinely check with the police in an applicant's hometown. The Harrisburg police were after him for two assaults on homosexual men. He'd given us an address that turned out to be a rooming house he stayed in from time to time. The police got his fingerprints there and a credit card gas receipt with his license number on it. His name wasn't John Grant at all. He just told us that. About a week later, he waited outside the building here and shoved Dr. Purvis down just for spite. What was his name, Dr. Danielson? I'd better spell it for you. It's J-A-M-E-G-U-M-B. Jame Gum. The houses on Fell Street, Frederica Bemmel Street, were termed waterfront because their backyards ended at a backwater of the Licking River in Belvedere, Ohio. Frederica's father, Gustav Bemmel, was a tall man with red-rimmed eyes of watery blue. Starling smelled vodka on his breath as he squinted at her identification. 
I don't know nothing new to tell you, he said. She went into Columbus on the bus to see about a job at that store there. She never come home. Mr. Bimmel, do you have Frederica's things? Are they here? Her room's in the top of the house. May I see? All right, come along. In an average home, Frederica's room would have been cheerful. In this bleak house, it was shrill. There was an echo of desperation in it. Frederica did not display photographs of herself in the room. Starling found one in the school yearbook on the small bookcase. Glee club, home ec club, so-and-so, band, 4-H club. One picture shows Frederica in the front row of the band. She is wide and fat, but her uniform fits better than the others. She's big, and she has beautiful skin. Here were a couple of diet plans, several issues of Big Beautiful Girl, junk jewelry, some makeup, a lot of skin stuff. When she pulled the string to light the closet, Starling was surprised at Frederica's wardrobe. She had very nice clothes. A quick look inside them, and Starling saw the reason. Frederica made her own, and made them well. Stacks of patterns were on a shelf at the back of the closet. Starling had specifically avoided thinking about Kimberly Emberg, but now the memory swamped her. She saw Kimberly on the slab in Potter. Starling remembered her plump back, the triangular patches of skin missing from her shoulders. Staring into the lighted closet, Starling saw the triangles on Kimberly's shoulders outlined in the blue dashes of a dressmaking pattern. The idea swam away and circled and came again, came close enough for her to grab it this time, and she did it with a fierce pulse of joy. Their darts. He took those triangles to make darts so he could let out her waist. Motherfucker can sew. Buffalo Bill's trained to seriously sew. He's not just picking out ready to wear. What did Dr. Lecter say? He's making himself a girl suit out of real girls. What did he ask me? Do you sew, Clarice? Damn straight I do. She started downstairs to use the telephone, but Mr. Bimmel was already calling her to the phone. Jerry Burroughs, darling. Good, Jerry, listen, I think Buffalo Bill can sew. He took those triangles off of Kimberly Emberg to make darts. Dressmaking darts, do you know what I'm saying? He's skilled, he's not just making caveman stuff. ID section can search known offenders for tailors, sale makers. Right, right, I'm punching up a line now. Listen up, uh, Jack wanted me to brief you. We got a name and a place that looks not bad. The hostage rescue team's on their way. To where? Calumet City, edge of Chicago. Subjects Jame, like name, last name Gum, alias John Grant, white male, 34, 190, brown and blue. Jack got a beat from John Hopkins. Your thing? Your profile on how he'd be different from a transsexual? It rang the cherries at the clinic. Chicago, you said. How do you know Chicago? A couple of years ago, Customs in L.A. stopped a suitcase shipped from Suriname that contained live pupae? Is that how you say it? Insects, anyway. Moths in it. The addressee was John Grant, care of a business in Calumet, called, get this, Mr. Hyde Leather Goods. Maybe the sewing fits with that. I'm relaying the sewing to Chicago in Calumet. No home address yet on Grant or Gum. The company's out of business. Can I go? No. Jack said you'd ask. We're looking for both names on the Entomology Magazine subscription lists. Knife Makers Guild, Known Offenders, The Works. You're doing Bimmel's acquaintances, right? Right. Justice says it's a tricky case to make if we can't catch him dirty. So watch for anything they can use up there. You see anything? Get to me fast. Starling went outside and walked in the junkie yard in Belvedere, Ohio, a long, long way from the action in Chicago. Her job, her duty, was to think about Frederica and how gum might have gotten to her. A criminal prosecution of Buffalo Bill would require all the facts. Gustav Bimmel joined her in the yard. Mr. Bimmel, did Frederica know anybody from Calumet City or the Chicago area? He shrugged and shook his head. Had she ever been to Chicago, to your knowledge? What do you mean, to my knowledge? You think a girl of mine's going off to Chicago and I don't know it? Did she know any men that sew, tailors or sale makers? She sewed for everybody. She could sew like her mother. I don't know of any men. She sewed for stores, for ladies, I don't know who. Who would you say was her best friend, Mr. Bimmel? Stacy Upgeige, since they were little. Do you know where I could get in touch with her? Stacy worked at the Franklin Insurance. I guess she still does. Starling walked to her car across the rutted yard, her head down, hands deep in her pockets. 
From the moment she had started to hunt for Buffalo Bill, a lot of extraneous noises had stopped. Now she felt a pure new silence in the center of her mind. Starling's FBI credentials got the undivided attention of Stacy Hubka's boss at the Franklin Insurance Agency. He offered Starling the privacy of his cubicle for the interview. Stacy Hupka had a round, downy face and wore her hair in frosted wings. Stacy, I'd like you to tell me how you think this might have happened to your friend, where this man might have spotted Frederica. Freaked me out. Get your skin peeled off. Is that a bummer? Did you see her? They said she was just like rags, like somebody let the air. Stacy, did she ever mention anybody from Chicago or Calumet City? No. We marched at Chicago one time in the Thanksgiving parade. When? Oh, um, eighth grade. That would be, what, nine years ago. The band just went there and back on a bus. Did you ever hear her mention anybody named Jane Gum or John Grant? Mmm, no. Do you think she could have had a boyfriend you didn't know about? Were there gaps in time, days when you didn't see her? No. She had a guy. I'd have known, believe me. <laughs> she never had a guy. Stacy, I'd like you to tell me about the people who Frederica sewed for. You know, me and her worked down at Richard's Fashions. Real nice clothes. The store manager spoke to Mrs. Lippman to see if Frederica could do some of the sewing, hymns and stuff. So Frederica did alterations for Richard's, the store where you worked. Sure. All Mrs. Lippman did everybody's alterations. She had the business, and she had more than she could do, and Frederica worked for her. After Mrs. Lippman retired, Frederica got it all and just kept sewing for everybody. Did Frederica ever work at the store, taking measurements? Did she meet customers or the wholesale people? Sometimes. Not much. I didn't work every day. Would the store manager know? Yeah, I guess. Frederica ever mentioned sewing for a company called Mr. Hyde in Chicago or Calumet City, maybe lining leather goods? I don't know. Mrs. Lippman might have. Do you know where Mrs. Lippman is? I'd like to talk to her. I never did know her. She died. Frederica said she went to Florida to retire and she died down there. You might could talk to her family or something. I'll write it down for you. And Richards, too, Stacy. I want to talk to the store manager. Okay. Officer Starling, <laughs> is it a pretty good job being an FBI agent? I think it is. Mr. Gum went ahead with it in the late afternoon. He took off his clothes and put on the robe. He always finished a harvest naked and bloody as a newborn. Quietly down the stairs now to the kitchen out of his slippers, and down the dark basement steps, staying close to the wall to keep the stairs from creaking. Moving by touch in the familiar dark, he went into his workroom. He found his infrared light and slipped the goggles on his head. Now the world glowed green. Quiet, he crept, knees bent, painted toes gripping the old boards, silent on the sand floor of the oubliette room, master of the dark queen of the dark. As he hurried about, ready to go, the doorbell rang. The doorbell grating, rasping, kept ringing. They didn't go away. Better go upstairs and peek out the front. The long-barreled Colt revolver wouldn't fit in the pocket of his robe. He put it on the workroom counter. As he went through the kitchen, a heavy knock on the back door made him jump. He opened the door a crack, knowing that he had a loaded pump shotgun in the pantry nearby. I tried the front, but nobody came. I'm looking for Mrs. Lippman's family. Could you help me? Clarice Starling showed her FBI identification. I know she lived here. Mrs. Lippman's been dead for ages. She didn't have any relatives that I know of. What's the problem? I'm investigating the death of Frederica Bimmel, who are you, please? Jack Gordon. I didn't mean to be rude. I was sleeping. Mrs. Lippman had a lawyer. I may have his card somewhere. I'll see if I can find it. He went to a roll-top desk in the far corner of the kitchen. Starling stepped inside. 
That horrible business, he said, rummaging the desk. I shiver every time I think about it. Are they close to catching somebody? Not yet, but we're working on it, Mr. Gordon. Did you take over this place after Mrs. Lippman died? Yes. Gum bent over the desk, his back to Starling. He opened a drawer and poked around in it. Out of the folds in the back of his robe crawled a black witch moth. It stopped in the center of his back, about where his heart would be, and adjusted its wings. Mr. Gum, thank God my coat's open. Talk my way out of here, get to a phone. No, he knows I'm FBI. I'll let him out of my sight, he'll kill her. Here's the number, he said, turning around. He had a business card. Take it? No. Good, thank you. Mr. Gordon, do you have a telephone I could use? As he put the card on the table, the moth flew. It came from behind him, past his head, and lit between them on a cabinet above the sink. He looked at it. When she didn't look at it, when her eyes never left his face, he knew. Their eyes met, and they knew each other. Mr. Gum tilted his head to the side and smiled. I have a cordless phone in the pantry. I'll get it for you. She went for her gun, one smooth move she'd made 4,000 times before. Freeze. Put up your hand slowly. Mr. Gum, you're under arrest. I want you to slowly walk outside. Instead, he walked out of the room. If he had reached for his pocket, reached behind him, if she'd seen a weapon, she could have fired. He just walked out of the room. She heard him run down the basement stairs. She ran around the table and stopped at the top of the stairwell, brightly lit and empty. A trap would be a sitting duck. From the basement, a thin scream. Catherine Martin screamed again, and Starling went down anyway, gun arm out, then swinging with her head as she tried to cover the two doors facing her. Lights blazing in the basement. She couldn't go through one door without turning her back on the other. Do it quick, then, toward the scream. Into the sand-floored oubliette room, eyes wider than they had ever been. Only place to hide was behind the well, she sliding sideways around the wall, both hands on the gun, arms out straight, a little pressure on the trigger, on around the well, and nobody. A small scream rising from the well like thin smoke. She looked over the edge, saw the girl. FBI, you're safe. Get me out! Get me out! Catherine, you'll be all right. I'll get you out. Be quiet so I can hear. She moved up to the door and took cover behind the facing. She could see across the foot of the stairs and into part of the workroom beyond. Either she found gum or she made sure he'd fled, or she took Catherine out with her. A quick look over her shoulder, around the oubliette. A rope. He had to have one. Where? Go see. Starling sprinted across the stairwell, inside fast, back and forth until she had seen all of the room. Quickly through the room, approaching the corridor beyond, head and gun at once. Empty. The studio blazing with light at the end of it. Fast along it, on into the studio. The room all white and blonde. Make sure every mannequin is just a mannequin. The far door open onto darkness. The basement beyond. No rope, no ladder anywhere. She closed the door into the dark part of the basement pushed a chair under the knob, and a sewing machine against it. Back down the corridor, into one door she'd passed. Nobody behind it. An old bathroom with rope, hooks, a sling. Get Catherine or go for the phone. She ducked inside for the rope. There was a big bathtub filled with red-purple plaster. A hand and wrist stuck up from the hardened surface. The shriveled hand turned dark, the fingernails painted pink. The dainty watch on the wrist was the last thing she saw before the lights went out. Her heart knocked hard enough to shake her chest and arms. Oh, dear Jesus, get out of the bathroom, move down and low, out in the hall. Catherine Martin was keening again. She moved quietly, her shoulder barely brushing the wall, the gun at waist level. Out into the workroom now. Felt the space opening up. In the crouch, in the open room, arms out, both hands on the gun, in the blackness. Against the wall stood Mr. Gum with his goggles on, 
playing his infrared light up and down her. She was too slender to be of great utility to him, but her hair was glorious, and that would only take a minute to slip off. A shot in the face would be fine and easy at eight feet. Now. He cocked the colt as he brought it up snick-snick, and the figure blurred, bloomed green in his vision, and his gun bucked in his hand, and the floor hit him hard in the back, and his light was on, and he saw the ceiling. Starling on the floor, flash blind, ears ringing, deafened by the blast of the guns, she'd fired four, he'd fired once. The sound of a revolver being cocked is like no other. She'd fired at the sound, seen nothing past the great muzzle flashes of the guns. Her ears still rang, but her hearing was coming back. What was that sound? Whistling? Like a tea kettle, but interrupted. It's breathing. It's a sucking chest wound. He's hit in the chest. What to do? Wait. Let him stiffen up and bleed. Starling's cheek stung. She didn't touch it. If it was bleeding, she didn't want her hands slick. Over the sucking in the dark, Starling heard Mr. Gum's ghastly voice choking. How does it feel to be so beautiful? And then a gurgle, a rattle, and the whistling stopped. There were about 50 people at National Airport in Washington meeting the red-eye flight from Columbus. From the crowd, Ardelia Mapp had a chance to look Starling over as she came off the plane. Starling was pasty, dark under the eyes, a couple of grains of black powder residue in her cheek. How you doing, Starling? Ardelia, I'm damned if I know. Jeff's outside in the van. Let's go home. Starling rode with her eyes closed until Mapp nudged her and handed over a Coke and a half pint of Jack Daniels. Starling took a swig and sank a little deeper in the seat. They had finished the half pint just outside of Quantico and dumped the evidence in a barrel at a roadside park. Hey, Starling, that Pilcher. Dr. Pilcher at the Smithsonian called three times, made me promise to tell you he called. He's not a doctor. You think you might do something about him? Maybe. I don't know yet. He sounds like he's pretty funny. I've about decided funny's the best thing in men. I'm talking about aside from money and your basic manageability. Yeah, and manners too. You can't leave that out. Right. Give me a son of a bitch with some manners every time. Starling went like a zombie from the van to the bed. Map woke some time before daylight. Starling was not in her bed. Both their laundry bags were gone. Map found Starling in the warm laundry room, dozing against the slow rump-rump of a washing machine. She knew that the machine's rhythm was like a great heartbeat, and the rush of its waters, the sound the unborn hear, our last memory of peace. Jack Crawford was going through the overnight telex traffic and watching the early news in his office when Starling pressed her nose to the glass of the door. As he waved her in, he dumped some reports out of a chair for her. Crawford took her to him and held her very tight for a moment, just a moment, and then put her away from him and kissed her on the forehead. I... you know what you did? You had a home run, kid. He touched her cheek. What's this? Burnt gunpowder. The doctor said it'll work out by itself in a couple of days, better than digging for it. The U.S. attorney in Columbus faxed me your depositions overnight. You'll have to sign some copies for him. So, you went from Frederica Bemmel's house to Stacy Hubka, and then to the store manager at Richard's Fashions, and she gave you Mrs. Lippman's old address, the building where you found Jane Gum. The store manager never mentioned a man at Mrs. Lippman's? No. How are you hitting him, Starling? Kind of numb. You too? Crawford nodded, quickly moved along. Elector's gone platinum. He's at the top of everybody's most wanted list. We need to be clear on this. You know he'd do it to Clarice Starling, just like he'd do anybody else. I don't think he'd ever bushwhack me. It's rude, <laughs> and he wouldn't get to ask any questions that way. Sure, he'd do it as soon as I bored him. Maintain good habits is all I'm saying. He went to his office door. Starling, I'm proud of you. So is John Brigham. So is the director. 
You pass your exams and you're still in school. It sounded stiff, not at all like he wanted it to sound. James Gum was news for weeks after he was lowered into his final hole. Reporters pieced together much of his history and revealed that Gum was working at the curio shop where the butterfly ornaments were made when he met Raspael and eventually lived off the musician. It was during this time that Gum became obsessed with moths and butterflies. After Raspael dumped him for Klaus, Gum killed, beheaded, and partially flayed the sailor. It was some time later that Raspael, ever thrilled by bad boys, introduced him to Dr. Lecter. This was proven in the week after Gum's death, when the FBI seized from Raspael's next of kin the tapes of the musician's therapy sessions with Dr. Lecter. The tapes included the final session in which Lecter killed Raspael. More importantly, they reveal how very much Raspael told Lecter about Jane Gum. Raspael told Dr. Lecter that Gum was obsessed with moths, that he had flayed people in the past, that he had killed Klaus, that he had a job with the Mr. Hyde Leather Goods Company in Calumet City, but was taking money from an old lady in Belvedere, Ohio, who had made linings for Mr. Hyde, Inc. Raspael correctly predicted that one day Gum would inherit everything the old lady had. When Lecter read that the first victim was from Belvedere and she was flayed, he knew who was doing it, Crawford told Starling as they listened together to the tapes. He'd have given you Gum and looked like a genius if Jilton had stayed out of it. He hinted to me by writing in the file that the sights were too random, and in Memphis he asked me if I sew. What did he want to happen? He wanted to amuse himself, Starling. He's been amusing himself for a long, long time. Ardelia Mapp was a great tutor. She could spot a test question in a lecture further than a leopard can see a limp. It was Sunday morning, and the two women had been on the books for several days. So, Starling... What did Pilcher say on the phone? He and his sister have this place on the Chesapeake. Next weekend he wants us to go. Yeah, and? He did this nice scenario, no hassles, bundle up and walk on the beach, come in and there's a fire going, dogs jump all over you with their big sandy paws. Idyllic. Mm-mm. Big sandy paws. Go on. I said, yes, thank you very much. Good. Eat some crabs, grab pilcher, and go wild. Dr. Lecter was in an excellent humor. His week had gone well. His appearance was coming right along, and as soon as a few small discolorations cleared, he could take off his bandages and pose for passport photos. Long before his first arrest, when his hobbies began to absorb him, Dr. Lecter had made provisions for the time when he might be a fugitive. This evening, writing at the desk in his suite, he was catching up on his correspondence, which he would have to send through a remailing service in London. First he dropped a note to Dr. Frederick Chilton in federal protective custody, suggesting that he would be paying Dr. Chilton a visit in the near future. After this visit, he wrote, it would make sense for the hospital to tattoo feeding instructions on Chilton's forehead to save paperwork. Next, as he poured himself a glass of the excellent Batard Montrachet wine, he addressed Clarice Starling. Well, Clarice, have the lambs stopped screaming? You owe me a piece of information, you know, and that's what I'd like. An ad in the national edition of the Times and in the international Herald Tribune on the first of any month will be fine. Better put it in the China Mail as well. I won't be surprised if the answer is yes and no. The lambs will stop for now. But, Clarice, you judge yourself with all the mercy of the dungeon scales at Threve. You'll have to earn it again and again, the blessed silence. Because it's the plight that drives you. Seeing the plight, and the plight will not end, ever. I have no plans to call on you, Clarice, the world being more interesting with you in it. Be sure you extend me the same courtesy. Dr. Lecter touched his pen to his lips. He looked out at the night sky and smiled. I have windows. Orion is above the horizon now, and near it Jupiter, 
brighter than it will ever be again before the year 2000. I expect you can see it too. Some of our stars are the same, Clarice. Hannibal Lecter Far to the east on the Chesapeake shore, Orion stood high in the clear night above a big old house and a room where a fire is banked for the night, its light pulsing gently with the wind above the chimneys. On a large bed there are many quilts, and on the quilts and under them are several large dogs. Additional mounds beneath the covers may or may not be noble pilcher. It is impossible to determine in the ambient light. But the face on the pillow, rosy in the firelight, is certainly that of Clarice Starling, and she sleeps deeply, sweetly, in the silence of the lambs. The Silence of the Lambs by Thomas Harris was abridged for audio by Judith Benenson. It was performed by Kathy Bates and directed by David Kaplan. It was recorded and edited by Karen Perlman. Elisa Shokoff was the production coordinator. The Silence of the Lambs was produced by Karen Froman for Simon & Schuster Audio. The Washington Post calls The Red Dragon by Thomas Harris the scariest book of the season. Simon & Schuster brings you the audio version of this terrifying thriller coming soon to your local book or record store. If you're interested in other Simon & Schuster audio productions, you can also order by mail using the enclosed postpaid card or call our toll-free number 1-800-678-2677.